Hello and welcome to the Weekly Stuff Podcast with Jonathan Lack and Sean Chapman. We are here as always to talk about stuff. This week on the show, our big topic will be the film Justice League, which is yawning its way into theaters right now. Yeah, uh, that's a good way to describe it. Yeah, uh, setting the world very much not on fire. Maybe pouring some cold water on the world. Maybe that's a better way to describe yeah. it. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. That'll be our spoiler topic for the episode. Uh, we also have a couple pieces of news, including the, what I have put on the outline as the Star Wars Battlefront 2 loot box clusterfuck extraordinaire. We will talk about that. We'll do a couple pieces of stuff. First, bit of housekeeping, yep. Sean. We just recorded uh, our fourth Doctor Who monthly bonus podcast. If you have not been following these, every month we've been revisiting an episode of classic Doctor Who uh, and doing a little like hour-long chat on that and kind of taking you through the different eras of the show. This month we got to the fourth Doctor, Tom Baker, and the story The Brain of Morbius. That episode will be coming out Wednesday, and I had a ton of fun recording that. Yes, and a ton of fun watching that that Doctor Who story because it is very good. Yeah, so watch the story, listen to the episode, more Doctor Who goodness uh, as we we approach. Actually, we got a new Doctor Who episode coming in a little over a month. That's true. So that's yeah. fun. We'll have a uh, new Doctor Who to talk about as well. They did put out a clip of that for the Children in Need special. Uh, they they had like yeah. two minutes from the Christmas special. I didn't watch the whole thing. I didn't watch it because I just right. When, once I heard that it was just pulled from the specials, like yeah. I'll I'll see it in context. Yeah, but I did like watch thirty seconds. My only reaction, totally spoiler free. Peter Capaldi's hair is weirdly long in this special. Good. And I kind of love it. But it's, I mean, it makes no continuity sense where with we left him in series 10. He's, he, he started regenerating and interrupted the regenerative pot process. Of course his, his hair, hair started to grow. He's regenerating. I hope that's a line in the episode. It distracted me just enough and it has in the trailers for it too. But it's fine. Uh, anyway. I like that every single time he has appeared as the doctor after a break, his hair is longer. It's, it's very true. Peter Capaldi this time next year is going to have like a ponytail. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's unfortunately he's leaving, so it'll, he'll have to cut his hair and, and go back to normal. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe that's just Capaldi wants his hair longer and longer. I guess I hadn't really considered. I thought he was just going for a John Pertwee, Tom Baker kind of thing. And okay, just yeah. Big hair. Maybe, who knows? But anyway, uh, so yes, that's our bonus podcast for the month. That'll be coming out Wednesday. It's a lot of fun. Uh, Sean, I have a couple pieces of stuff. All right. Do you have any stuff? Uh, nothing really worth talking about. I've just sort of been poking around here and there. I've, I've gone back to playing Neo and kind of playing some Hatsune Miku on the side when I need, I need a bolt of, yeah. of just pure joy in my life. But nothing nice. like to go into. I'm going to talk about two video games in a second, like really quickly. One piece of stuff related to Doctor Who, which yeah. we've been talking about, is the uh, Blu-ray box set for Series 10 just came out this week. Um, the, the modern Series 10, the yeah. last Capaldi season, which I was very excited to get. I had gotten through Series 9, and I was ready to rewatch this latest season. And the Blu-ray comes in, and to my sadness, they have cheapened the shit out of the packaging for the Blu-rays this year. I know a lot of people won't care. A lot of people maybe don't get physical media anymore. But I do have a pretty extensive Doctor Who physical media collection. And if you've been following modern Doctor Who releases, since they switched to Blu-ray, they've had this cool packaging style in the States where they're like these fold-out digi-books where like the, the, the each disc is on its own kind of page. Yeah. And the info folds out and they have artwork and they have all the episodes and descriptions and like who wrote and directed them. Just those nice little things you want when you pay 60 bucks for a Blu-ray set. This year they have completely made the switch. It's just a regular Blu-ray package yeah. with just a little slip cover. It, there's nothing special about it. The only insert is an ad for the Christmas special. It doesn't have any info on episodes or anything like that. Like The episode titles are on the discs, which is helpful enough. But I would love at least a little booklet or something. They have none of that. And the most insulting thing is the price is still the same. And the price of right. Doctor Who sets over here is outrageous. It's way too much. And I love Doctor Who. But I'll say that. Like, the only reason I bought this one um, the day it came out, usually I wait for a sale, is that I'm trying to watch through them all again. And I had, like, an Amazon gift card, so it was cheaper for me. But it's still... It just kind of sucks. They've also... You know, they keep cutting back on the bonus features. The only stuff on the Season 10 stuff is all the, um, the inside look things that they did online. And then the fan show... Uh, extras that were on YouTube, and I love all that stuff, 
but it isn't like new for yeah. the Blu-ray. It's and it's also stuff that you can watch for free on YouTube. Yeah, and yeah. it's it's nice to have archived on here because it might not be on YouTube forever. But sure. it, but still, it's like I would just expect that plus maybe something else. And there's a couple of commentaries. I listened to about half of the one with uh, Pearl Mackey and Stephen Moffat did a commentary for the pilot episode, and uh, that's a lot of fun. That Stephen Moffat's always fun to hear from. Yeah, because he seems a little weird, and I like that. Um, I mean, when way. you've been in the Doctor Who minds as long as he has, there's no way you come out of that totally sane. He sounds tired in every interview these days. Like, poor, he's been working on Doctor Who for a long he's time. He's been working on Doctor Who longer than most people in the history of that show have. Yes. Um, I mean, if you consider that he wrote in 2005, that's 14 calendar years he's written a Doctor Who episode. Yeah, that's <laughs> anyway. just, that's not, th- like, his doctor should have t- stepped in at some time point and said, like, this isn't good for your health. Like, you need to step, <laughs> maybe that is what happened, is like, nope. Anyway, so, like, you know, I still, it's, it's, otherwise the quality is pretty much the same as the other Blu-ray sets. I'm just disappointed. Like, at least they could have waited for the next season to make the switch over. Because now, like, you have Capaldi season 8, season 9 look nice and identical on the shelf, and then season 10 is, like, half the thickness. And that kind of thing just drives me up the wall. Sure. Because yeah. it's like, just keep it consistent one more season you know i don't know um they they've been re- as of recent like the last couple of years since they did the split in season six they've also always put out the blu-rays as like a part one part two bare bones set i might just start doing that in the future because they're a little bit cheaper they come out faster and if there's no packaging difference it doesn't really matter yeah but anyway um it's just too bad it's it's all going that way unfortunately uh, i'm happy i can get doctor who on blu-ray at all over here yeah but yeah but it is something that, like, it's just sort of counterintuitive of, you know, once everything is is going digital and is the, there's the convenience of digital, it feels like physical needs to sell itself by, like, contrasting that and saying, like, well, th- we are extravagant, you know, like, we're premium. Yeah. If, if you buy us, you have, like, the best video quality, you have this, like, really nice packaging that you can put on your shelf and it looks cool and we have all these nice extras and director's commentary and all this kind of stuff that you're not going to get if you just buy, like, the season on Amazon Prime or something, you know? And yeah, it's it's just disappointing to see things. Yeah, like, I mean, the physical media lose like the charms that it has had. And it's it's also people shooting themselves in the foot because phys- people who collect physical media are by definition enthusiasts. Yeah. And so your packaging and everything should try to match that as much as possible. This is why the Criterion Collection is still in business. Yeah. And has not like, you know, they're not putting their movies in like little envelopes and sending them to you, you know. They're in nice, you know, hardy cases. They've made some little cutbacks here and there. But like, you know, you have an enthusiast market, treat them like that. Yeah. I don't like it when they do this. Anyway, uh, two games I bought this week. Okay. I want to talk about. Both re-releases, sort of. I got Skyrim for the Nintendo Switch. Sure, yeah. That's it's, a good video game. It's awesome. Um, I also had a gift card for that. So, like, I probably would not have bought it at, like, full $60 if I didn't. But I had, like, a gift card for my birthday last month. So I did that. And um, very good use of that. Because Skyrim is a lot of fun. It's awesome yeah. on the Nintendo Switch. Um I, you know, have not done a full, like, technical analysis or anything, although I've read some of the reports and, like, you know, if you look at, like, the Digital Foundry report, which is, they're always the most in-depth, yeah. um, it seems like this is technically a really, really solid port, and to my eye, I have only extensively played Skyrim on the Xbox One, the Special Edition, this looks effectively identical to that. Um, there's some things I've noticed, like once in a while, not overall draw distance in terms of like you can always see the horizon, um, and that's always prioritized in Skyrim. But like just where foliage will pop in and stuff is definitely sure. less on the Switch. Um, you know, the resolution is a little lower handheld versus docked, those sorts of little things. But otherwise, it's the Skyrim's. It's much closer to the Skyrim Special Edition than it is the vanilla, like, Mm -hmm. Xbox 360 version. It has all the other accoutrements they added with the Special Edition, like quick saving, and all of the DLC is in there. So it is just, it's Skyrim. It's not 4K 60fps PC Skyrim. Right. But if you want that, you probably don't even own a Nintendo Switch. So, you know whatever like yeah. um you'll know if you want it or not i think it's really cool to have skyrim on the switch both the, for the portability which i love i've you know spent a couple hours just playing it handheld and it's great it plays wonderfully um but also just i one of the things i love about the switch is that because it is effectively a mobile device it you know shuts on and off in instantaneously it's like suspend resume thing is much faster obviously than 
you know, the uh, Xbox One or the PS4. So like with Skyrim, you know, big giant game, if you need to step away from it for a little bit, you can just turn the system off, come back in, and there won't be any problems. And that's actually one of the most impressive things to me about the port is that you would think there would be some times where turning it off might fuck the game up a little bit, like that has happened to me on Xbox One with certain games. Mm -hmm. doesn't happen at all on the Switch. So it is a very, very well-optimized port. And other than that, it's Skyrim. I'm having a lot of fun. I'm a Dark Elf. Uh, and the Dark Elf like design I picked looked enough like the Roger Delgado Master okay. that my character is just named the Master, which I like. Sure. Um, I also have made him fairly evil. I'm doing everything I can to like learn sneaking and pickpocketing and like lock picking because I do find that very fun. Just going around and thieving everything I possibly can in Skyrim. Yeah. I don't remember if there's some sort of like charm spell in Skyrim, but if there is, you should learn that and go around and say like, "You will obey." Me! And then yes. you take control of someone and have them fight for you. I also did use uh, some... Uh, my brother has a bunch of Zelda amiibo, and I did go through those and get all the Zelda amiibo gear. And there's the, the Hylian shield, the Master Sword, and the Champion's tunic from Breath of the Wild. And I have all of that. My character's all decked out. It's hilarious to have uh, this guy with the goatee and everything cosplaying as Link. And it is also... A real surreal thing to be playing a very violent video game on a Nintendo console where with your Hylian Shield and Master Sword you can behead and impale people. Yeah. I don't know if you saw the video I put on Twitter of that where it's one of the finishing animations and he just stabbed through this lady and the shield was like full on in the shot. And I just looked at that and it's like it's like blood pouring out of this person's wound while the Hylian Shield is right there. And I'm thinking, I cannot believe Nintendo okayed this, but I'm so happy they did. Yeah. Nintendo has... The stick is not fully out of Nintendo's butt this year, but it's coming out, and it's fun to see that. Yeah, it's been a long time. Yes. So, anyway, I mean, this has been an interesting month. That This is the only major uh, Switch port I've bought this month, but we also got Doom and L.A. Yeah. Noir, and it sounds like people are really uh, loving the chance to play those on the Switch. Like, Doom is a more compromised version versus, like, Skyrim. But also, like, it's Doom. It's a brand new video game. Yeah. It's amazing it runs on that at all. And if that's the only console you own, you should play Doom that way. Yes, yeah. No, you know? this is a game well worth playing. Yeah, so I just I just think that's cool. And I think bodes well because... Remember the first round of ports for the Wii U, Sean? Yes. No, no one was yeah. positive on those. No, yeah. I remember watching the videos of the frame rate in Batman Arkham City yeah. Armored Edition. And I, it scarred me to this day. I and, didn't play it. Yeah, I mean, it just... It just does speak well that we've had all these ports for the Switch, and while some of them are more technically compromised, none of them are unplayable at all. Like, they're all right, perfectly yeah. playable, which is very cool. And I like that Bethesda in particular is on board. I actually think for Bethesda, you know, they have had some sales woes these last few years with some of their single-player games. I think that partnership with Nintendo could do well for them, yeah. because when you put out a game on PS4 or Xbox in the middle of October, you get buried... When you do it on the Nintendo Switch in one of those months, you get a lot of attention yeah. from that fan base. So I, I think it's an interesting, positive thing. Like, you've seen Doom and Skyrim in the news a lot lately because they got ports on this system. Well, so. we've been seeing Doom in the news for different reasons lately. But yeah, that's, yeah that's just been 2017. Is Doom yeah, I, I, meant, I meant Doom all caps with, you know, Oh, oh like Doom 2016. Doom. Yeah, 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 Okay, okay, yeah, 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 no. yeah, that makes sense. Now, the other game I've played, which I was not, it was kind of an impulse buy for me, is uh, Pokemon Ultra Sun. Oh, right, yeah, the sort of, like, re... Like, not re-release, but, like, updated version of Pokemon Sun and Moon. Which, yeah. Which, did those come out in 2015? No, that was last year, actually. Okay, Jesus. I'd kind of forgotten, too. Um, you might... I did not talk about Pokemon Sun extensively on the podcast last year. Yeah. I did get it. It did not grab me. I didn't play more than 10 hours of it. Um, but then I heard about... I'd, I'd seen all the videos for Ultra Sun coming out, and it, all the stuff they were adding looked really cool to me. And it was like, I'd kind of like to play one more 3DS game this year, or just have something to play. Like, I don't, I also didn't feel like I needed to play all of this Pokemon game right now. I just kind of like to have it for the future. And it turned out that Best Buy had a really good trade in value on Pokemon Sun. And I'm like, oh, I can just go. trade right up. And I did that. Ultra this motherfucker. Ultra this motherfucker. And then I had a couple other little things lying around that I was able to, to pawn off. And I basically got Ultra Sun for free. So it was kind of an impulse buy. And I've played more of it than I thought I would, actually. Because I thought I was going to spend this weekend mostly on Skyrim. And Ultra Sun has really drawn me in. Now, the first thing to know, though, is what this game is and what it isn't. And it's important to know that because Nintendo has not... Not marketed it um, particularly honestly, I would say. Okay. Um, in that the marketing for Ultra Sun has looked a lot like um, 
Black and White 2, which were back in the day on the Nintendo DS, where instead of doing like the crystal emerald yellow upgrade where it's like one final version they did full-on sequels to pokemon black and white that was gen 5 i guess and uh, i didn't play those but i know people like black and white 2 a lot because it's like the same region but new story and characters and stuff and that's not what ultra sun and moon is ultra sun and moon are very much in the vein of pokemon crystal or pokemon emerald or the last time they did this was pokemon platinum which was Gen 4 for the Nintendo DS. So it's been forever since they've done this kind of thing. And I've also seen online, right, Pokemon is like this evergreen thing. There's a lot of kids who don't remember that. Oh, right, and are yeah. like, sure. And I've seen some kids being like, they only added this and this and this to Ultra Sun. Like, that's bullshit. This should have been DLC. And I'm like, oh, you sweet summer child. You have no memory of the days when, like, I would save up my money for the new version of Pokemon. And it was 99% the same with a little bit at the yeah. end. Like... Ultra Sun, I should say, does, to my understanding, I'm not to most of the new stuff, it does have more new stuff than, like, Pokemon Crystal or Emerald did. Um, but it has a similar kind of enjoyment to those, if you remember those from back in the day, where you would get that third, like, final Pokemon version, and it was, like, that generation, but, like, polished. They've added all these kind of new quality of life things in. Maybe there's some new Pokemon and story elements. And it just feels like this really good definitive version of the game. That's what Ultra Sun feels like to me so far. Um, most of the new, like, big new stuff does not come until later in the game. So I cannot comment on that, although it seems pretty cool. Um, what I can comment on so far is that, you know... For at least the early part of the game, it's basically the same thing story and progression-wise. They've done enough little tweaks, though, that I am finding myself enjoying this more than I did Pokemon Sun this time last year. Um, for one, they've cut out enough of the tutorialized fat that, like, it moves a little faster. It's still a very hand-holdy Pokemon game. And in parts, that works because it's also more story-heavy. So that's just a natural thing. It's going to take you to places more directed than other Pokemon games. In other times, it's like... I know how to catch a Pokemon. You do not need to tutorialize this anymore. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah, um, I don't need to talk to an old man standing like almost outside the village who's going to drag me over to this thing and show me how to yes. catch a fucking Rotata. Yeah, no. They still do that. That's kind of weird. But they've cut out some of the fat. Um, they've upgraded the UI. It's nicer and cleaner. And they've added some little quality of life things. One other balance thing I've noticed that's made a world of difference to me is that they have packed this sucker full of Pokemon. First patch of grass I was able to walk through and catch Pokemon in, I caught an entire party's worth of Pokemon. Jesus. All different. I caught, in that one patch, six Pokemon. So five to fill out my party and sent one to the PC. I just finished the first of the Island Trials, which is like this game's versions of gyms. I already have one box almost all the way full. And for that one island, that's only 20% of that island's Pokedex. So this game has a crazy amount of Pokemon in it, and they just throw them at you everywhere. It's not like you will go through a patch of grass and just see, I forget the name of the Pokemon, this game's version of a Zigzagoon a hundred times. Right. Like, you'll see it, yeah, but you, you will you see... You mean this game's version of Rattata, please. Yeah. Let's, anyway. let's be wholesome about this. I just mean that Rattata is at least a cool Pokemon. Yeah, okay. Zigzagoon yeah. is not. <laughs> That's my joke. Anyway, um, so like there are there are so many Pokemon and there are no like down moments where it's like, oh man, they only have these. Like no, you are constantly, especially with the day-night cycle and times of day and all that, which is very fleshed out in these games. Like there's a lot, definitely more than last time around. And that alone kind of is making me have a little more fun with it in that I'm... Just constantly catching new Pokemon and altering my team and stuff, that's fun. It does, at this point, someone needs to tell Nintendo that six Pokemon on your team is kind of weird when you have 400 in the game. Right. But anyway, uh, we'll deal with it for now. Um, but I'm having fun with it. Like, it's been a couple of years since I full-on did a Pokemon game, and I never really gave Sun and Moon that much of a chance, and I would like to see these through to the end. And so I just thought, I'll upgrade to this one. This is like the definitive version. It has all this cool new stuff that I want to see. Uh, and I'll let you guys know if anything changes. But I am having fun with it so far. Cool. Um, and I feel like I will play more of it. But, you know, i just uh, been a busy year for gaming. Relaxing with yeah. a little kind of light Pokemon is fun. You know, it's a good I, way to I get that. Yeah. Yeah. Also, those games are fucking beautiful. Like I, the, obviously, like especially with Nintendo, we now have like the Switch, which is capable of much more advanced graphics. The color scheme and everything in Sun and Moon is awesome. It might even look better here with some of the little refinements they've done. So that's cool. If you have never played Sun and Moon and want to play that generation, obviously start with Ultra Sun. Right. Don't go for the last ones. If you played Sun and Moon to death, you probably don't need these, but you'll know better than I will what you want out of Pokemon. So sure. I don't know how quite to recommend that. Any other stuff, Sean, to talk about? No, I don't think so. No. All right. 
Now let's talk the news, and we have to start with two sad pieces of news. Yeah. Um, the first one is is bigger to me personally. Um, and some of you listening might not know this person's name, uh, but a few days ago, um, the Japanese voice actress Hiromi Suru uh, died at the age of 57. Um, I don't know if they've determined the cause of her death yet. Um, yeah. She was found in her car. Um, it's not clear exactly. Um, it sounds like it was natural causes, but it's not entirely clear what happened. Um, and Hiromi Suru is most famous for voicing Bulma in Dragon Ball and Dragon yeah. Ball Z and Dragon Ball GT and Dragon Ball Kai and Dragon Ball Super and every Dragon Ball video game. And, you know, um, if you're a Dragon Ball fan, uh, especially of the, you know, Japanese yeah. version, this is a voice you have heard countless hours of. Um, she is, you know, right there with Masako Nozawa, who voices Goku, and Joji Yanami, who until recently voiced uh, the narrator and then Kaiosama as someone who was there day one episode one of Dragon Ball 1986 and has been in the show ever since. Bulma is not necessarily in every single episode, yeah. but she's in a lot of it. And Hiromi Tsuru was just a phenomenal voice actress. I think her voice for Bulma was both iconic and also a genuinely amazing and impressive performance because that's a character in Dragon Ball who goes through so many transformations and is so many different versions of that character over the life of the series up to and including the material in Dragon Ball Super today and she was always phenomenal and always made that character pop and frankly Bulma in the Japanese original version of Dragon Ball is more interesting than I think she is even on the page in the manga because that voice adds so much humanity to what could be you know, I think we might think of as a more shallow part in some parts of the series. Yeah. She was great, and, you know, um, it's sad to think about mortality in this way. Uh, Joji Yanami, who, again, voiced the narrator in all of Dragon Ball, is still alive, um, but he has had severe health issues, and near the start of Dragon Ball Super had to stop voicing, and that meant that, uh, like, episode 13, I think, of Dragon Ball Super is the first episode ever that Dragon Ball didn't have him. And soon, you know, we're going to enter an era of Dragon Ball where they don't have her, and Masako Nozawa is kind of the last one standing from day one of Dragon Ball, at least in terms of characters who are a constant. Yeah. Uh, I think the guy who voiced Yamcha has always done it, but he's not in episode yeah. one, you know? Those are the three characters, in ep those are the three voices in episode one, and... Um, it's just it breaks it really does break my heart because when you love a series like this and it's been on this long, you kind of have more of a personal connection than in a lot of cases. No, definitely. And it's also that she was fifty seven when she died, so it's like it, it was really shocking. Uh because I mean I had the same reaction where I didn't necessarily grow up with the Japanese cast of Dragon Ball, but I have I've watched all of it with the Japanese cast and you know, like like her performance is so incredible and is such an anchor in that show um and and it's something of where like at this point like i like when i think of bulma i think of her performance which is amazing for someone who grew up on the the english dub and like that was an obsession when i was a kid that her performance completely overtook the english performance like before i was even done watching through the whole series in well i think if you've only watched dragon ball in english you might not know what we're talking about with how good yeah. a character bulma is because uh the current actress monica real i do like but i think they've had trouble with bulma uh in the past in dragon ball dubs yeah. um she's always been great and, and you said like that's the voice you hear in your head you know who else was that way Akira Toriyama, author of Dragon right. Ball, because those early voices he hand he helped hand pick, you know, Masako Nozawa and Hiromi Tsuru. And he he said I don't know if he said this about Hiromi Tsuru, but I know I've seen quotes where he said this about Masako Nozawa, where he's heard that voice when he writes Goku. I assume it has to be the same for Bulma, because, you know, the anime only started a couple years after the manga. Yeah. So, you know, much of the manga was written after the anime had started airing. So I just think she's a truly indelible part of that character. Yeah, and it's just something where, you know, Dragon Ball, like Japanese Dragon Ball has had to recast a number of roles over the years because of deaths or, or whatever has happened. And, and this is one of the ones that, I mean, this is the one that hurts the most in so many ways. It's just like that she was such an incredibly warm, powerful presence in that show even if Bulma can sometimes be a slightly absurd, absurd character in scenes, she has particularly, you know, with the resurgence with Dragon Ball Super and this older Bulma, uh, like, like she has such a warm kind of motherly presence in the show. And it's something that 
uh, it's it's also just kind of heartbreaking that her is it's heartbreaking in in both like this kind of like warm weirdly like coincidentally fitting way, but also like thinking about like th- what happens with Dragon Ball Super, which is still ongoing, is that like the last scene that she was in voicing like with Bulma was right before all the sort of like the major cast went off to like this alternate dimension to fight a big like tournament. Basically, is what the current arc is in. And it's been in that in that arc for a while now. And so obviously she's not a fighter character, so she didn't go, but she's basically like waving everybody else off to go like fight for the sake of their like entire universe, basically, is, is the last line she says in the show. And and like that's it's again, it's a like kind of beautifully fitting moment that she's sort of like waving everybody else off to the future. But then it's also really heartbreaking to think like what like what does that show do? Like what like how can how can you go back with Bulma? Like how could you possibly recast Bulma? And I, I, I don't idea. know. It's and we're gonna get to that point sadly because this cast is mortal. Whether yeah. it's five years from now, ten years from now, twenty years from now, you know, a lot of these voice actors will pass away. And I do think there's gonna come a point where I think there are certain lines in the sand where Dragon Ball can't continue without some voices. Like the day, God willing, it's 30 years from now, Bosco Nozawa passes away, you have to end it. Yeah. You cannot do Dragon Ball without her. You know, I also can't imagine, like, how do you have Vegeta on the show without Ryo Horikawa or just yeah. all these different people? And again, I'm not being morbid, it's just Dragon Ball is this evergreen thing, but I also, there, I just think there's a point where you can't do it once people have passed away. Bulma. I you can't write her out of the show. I you know uh-huh, yeah. I think you're gonna have to do something. And it's you know look, it's happened before. Um, you know one of the the first huge death in Dragon Ball was actually at the very end of when Dragon Ball Z was airing, when the original voice actor for Mutant Roshi died, yeah. Kame Senin. And um, that original voice is always the voice of Kame Senin to me. And even though he died when I was like four, that still kind of hurts inside that like they've had to recast him several times because of that. Yeah. Um, but you know, um, you you also just can't erase Kame Senin from the universe. Yeah. And Bulma is a major part of the show, but also not. She's not Goku. I think the show can move forward. It's just you're always going to hear it. It's going to be sad. You know, uh, Mr. Satan is another one. Yeah. When uh, Daisuke Gori, who's just one of the greats of, of Japanese animation voices, when he died in, I think, 2009, that was so sad. But, you know, they've been able to make it work, even though whenever I hear Mr. Satan and it's not Daisuke Gori, it hurts a little inside. Yeah. But, you know, they can, they can do it. It's kind of like when you hear Kermit today and it's not Jim Henson or something. But... That's the world we live in, and it is transient, and it is sad. And I guess it's just—it's weird because you're so used to like with voice acting projects that they can just go on. Yeah, it feels like it can just go on forever because, like, you know, their voices are going to age somewhat. But it's not like you know, if you have an actor on screen, they're going to age much more vis- visibly, much more quickly, and make it harder to keep on playing that role without accounting for the aging of the character. Whereas, like voice acting, you know, like I, I still listen to big Finnish Doctor Who dramas every now and then, and it's like you know, I'm listening to fucking Peter Davison, who you know is like thirty plus years older now than when he was playing the Doctor, and you and it just is it feels basically seamless to me. Like obviously, if I listen to his voice side by side. Yeah, yeah. I would tell the difference, but it, it is just like, it, it, it just feels like when you're listening to that kind of voice acting stuff, it, it exists in this nice comfortable area where you don't have to think about it that much, that you don't have to think about the mortality of the people playing the character because it's more abstract and it's more evergreen, yeah. And but it, that's not the case forever. But, you know, um, so they will probably, you know, move on one day with another Bulma actress. It, you know, they're in the middle, I am not caught up on Super, I've seen very little of it actually yeah. but um any uh, uh but they are in the middle of this arc where bulma is not an active presence at the moment when they get back to earth they're probably going to have to make a decision if they do recast you know best wishes to whoever has to step into those big shoes but uh hiromi suru will always be the definitive yeah. bulma and um it's, it's so tragic 57 is so young and she god she'd been doing this since she was like 20 yeah that's nuts and I, I, but what a legacy, you know, there are truly millions and millions of people around the world to whom her work meant a lot. And that's why I wanted to talk about it. Yeah. And we're two of those people. Yeah. No, definitely. And I will always think of, you know, I can hear her right now saying Son Kun. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, just breaks my heart.
It's it is it's going to be weird because I assume she f- probably finished her voice acting for the Dragon Ball Fighters game that's early next year. Oh, if, she's, because they have a story mode yeah. that her character is going to be featured in. Oh boy, yeah. So, well, it'll be nice to hear more from her, I guess, yeah. if there is more. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, you want to move on? Yeah. All right. One other death to talk about is um, a little outside of our comfort zone. We don't usually get into music much, but I know this was a band that we both. Definitely went through a phase with. Sure, yeah. Uh, Malcolm Young, the lead guitarist and, and co-founder of ACDC, died this week at 64. Also notable because, again, just young. And yeah. He, he had severe dementia, too, at the age of 64. That's just tragic. It happens, but it, it's tragic. Yeah. Um, ACDC is one of those bands that I think that every American teenage male goes through a phase with. Is that fair to say? You have to. You have yeah. to. And I still, from time to time, they're, you know... And part of it is the guitar work, which is why Malcolm Young, yeah. that one hits, because, boy, great guitarist. I love the the guitar work in ACDCs, especially their early work. Um, so I just wanted to mention that that one, too, because uh, even though ACDC is not as active a presence in my musical life these days, I definitely listen to them a lot in high school. Yeah. And occasionally and, now. And it's also, like, you know, I... I play the guitar. Like, that's one of the ways I came to ACDC is learning how to play some of their music. So it does... Yeah, it's sad it's just yeah yeah i don't know what more to say you know he had not been with the band for a while acdc is not all that relevant a band these days um i think they actually put on an album recently though which is weird but anyway um you know just something i noticed and i thought i'd put on the outline to pay our respects yeah Um, definitely definitely a, a very very talented guitarist um, all right, let's let's transition to some silly news, Sean. All right, what's going on in the news? And I don't know what better way to kind of make the transition than with this piece of silly news, which is that Nintendo is nearing a deal with Illumination Entertainment, creators of Despicable Me and Minions, as well as the greatest sin ever committed in the name of Dr. Seuss, the Lorax, uh, right. to, to create a Mario Brothers movie. This is from no less a source than the Wall Street Journal. And my reaction to this on Twitter was, God, no! Please, God, no! No, no, no! Don't let these fuckers touch Mario. Don't do it. Don't Just do it. Just don't. Don't fucking do this. Look, reaction one, Mario doesn't work on film. We know that. <laughs> yeah. Two... Not Illumination, please. For just any look, Japan. You have your own giant anime industry. You could make a cool Mario anime yeah. movie. You've done it before, kind of. Like I know you could do it. Don't hand it off to these soulless, money grubbing CGI fuckers who can't, could not direct their way out of a box. I hate Illumination Entertainment. They made one movie I enjoyed and it was Despicable Me 1 and then they ran that into the fucking ground with the horrible Despicable Me 2 which is just an insult to humanity. Minions which is even worse. Uh, just all this shit and that Lorax movie which just... the the It would have been less disrespectful to film a drunk meth addict pissing on Dr. Seuss's grave for two hours and put that into theaters, like full-on shot of just the penis pissing on Dr. Seuss's grave, that would be less insulting I mean, than that, that fucking like Lorax movie. I mean, that sounds like avant-garde movie to me, I've based seen, on your education. I've, I've probably seen that, Sean, and repressed it, okay? But anyway, still less insulting than what they did in the Lorax, which is basically this movie that is like, wink, wink, corporations are bad, Wait, here buy a Lorax toy. Corporations are... It's, it's such a confused clusterfuck of a movie, and I hate it. And, you know, that's Dr. Seuss, which means a lot to me. Mario also maybe means even more to me. Don't do it. I don't want Mario going around with a rock, like an electric guitar, singing bad rock songs about oh. the environment while he tries to sell you dinner at Denny's. Stop this. It is just like thinking about Mario in the, like... That sort of kid, like CG animated kids movie mold with like weird, like, like top quote unquote topical like pop culture references that are dated <sighs> like before the movie even comes out. Yes, and yeah, just like weird like scatological humor that like I do, that you don't know is like this is like too, almost too racy for kids, but like the the style of humor you're going for is should be for kids. Now, I don't know what the fuck like what movie you're making or what audience you're making this movie for. They're like DreamWorks but more bankrupt morally and yeah. uh, uh, creatively, and I hate it. And it just 
<sighs> like I don't what what I here's where I'm gonna sh take out a gun and shoot myself is when we get the poster with all these celebrity names on top for the Super Mario Bros movie, and that's where I wanted this conversation to go. Who plays Mario? Because it's not Charles Martinet. No, it is not Charles Martinet. I don't even know because like, I'm also just assuming that Di Mario has actual dialogue in this movie because I don't know I don't know what you do that does not have Mario have dialogue in the movie. Well, here's what I was gonna say. Uh, if the last few weeks had gone differently, I think they would have had Louis C.K. as Mario. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> they still can. They, they still, still can. Here's the thing. Illumination it's not like made, it's illegal. Illumination's movie from last year, The Secret Life of Pets, Louis C.K. is the main dog in that. There so they've go. worked with him, and that's just the name that popped into my head of like, what weird comedian they probably know they shouldn't be working with would they work with anyway for their beloved children's property? That one pops into my head. Um... I don't know. Uh, Chris Pine is Luigi. Um, um, if, no, let's do it with the Chris's. Chris Pine is Luigi. Okay, um, yeah. Chris uh, Pratt is Mario, I think, in this world. I sure, think you have so two he's Chris's. a bit of like a comedic Mario. Yes. Is what you're going for. I think okay. we're going to have that, yeah. Uh, Bowser. Oh, man. Bowser is... See, I'm thinking of other actors Illumination has worked with. Like, they're going to have Benedict Cumberbatch as the Grinch, and I could totally see them getting Benedict Cumberbatch as Bowser. But I mean, they just reuse all of his work from The Hobbit. <laughs> Maybe they do that. Uh, what other, like, big name, like, British actor would they get for Bowser? Uh, uh, Liam Neeson is Bowser. Liam Neeson, okay. That's, that's actually cool. That actually sounds cool. cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, Selena Gomez is Peach. Um... See, they already did Taylor Swift in the L Lorax movie, and Taylor Swift doesn't act anymore, so I don't think they're going to do that. I'm like, like, if I was more in touch with like modern pop music, I would have to imagine there has to be like the new Taylor Swift that people don't quite know that well yet. That would be the Peach. Yes, but I'm just thinking Selena Gomez is a recording artist, is also an actress, and still has like relative uh, cultural cash, so like she yeah. could do that. Um, yeah, who else would be in it? Like Toad is Anthony Hopkins. I was going just, to say Danny DeVito as Toad. Okay, I was thinking just like you need this like really high class like like <laughs> actor that just like that needs to buy a third house or something and is willing to just slum it for the worst shit. And Anthony Hopkins seems to do that sometimes. So I was like, yeah, you know, he does. Anthony Hopkins uh, has no no standards. Yeah. I don't think. Um, God, uh, Jim Belushi is Birdo. That's just Birdo's happen. in the movie. Yeah, why not? It's Jim Belushi. That makes because uh, they'll do it as a gag. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can see that. And then they'll do some, like, really awful gag where it's like, but you look like a girl! And it'll be really insulting. Um, I also look forward to the, like, meaningless cameo that they give Charles Martinet. That he yes. gets, like, one weird cameo as, like, a dude who sells a newspaper or something. I just, I'd love to play the funny casting game, and maybe I'll go home, and for my homework, I will come up with silly voices for next time. But I don't even want to imagine it, because here's the thing, we're pro we've probably already gotten one of these right. Oh, sure, yeah. No, and I just, I, again, like... If anything were to ever drive me to insanity, it could be this. Yeah. It's like violent insanity. But thinking about this has also made me think about like a, a weird connection. As I don't know if you know this, but in the 80s, Nintendo made a, a like Japanese animated Mario it's, movie. It's good. It's 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 okay. It's okay. It's better than it has any right to be. That's all I mean. Which is also like a it's a fascinating like footnote in the history of mario of like what if mario was, was a thing and what's really amazing to me about that movie is that mario is voiced by toru fudia who <laughs> is the voice of yamcha also the voice of amuro from mobile suit gundam i mean he's like fucking everything he's oh it's, like, yeah, it's toru fudia he's yeah. from saint seiya it's he's he's one of the great like japanese voice actors you'd probably like recognize your voice if you heard it just like that's he's great in everything <laughs> Just cast him again. Just make yeah. Mario as Japanese. Like, just, like, fucking confuse the shit out of the nationality, everything. <laughs> oh, you know what? Here's the worst thing they could possibly do. Sean, I figured it out, and I am 90% sure they're actually going to do this. Mm -hmm. Roberto Benigni is Mario. That fucker mm -hmm. comes back to America. Which mm -hmm. I think we kicked him out after we gave him that undeserved Oscar for the really insensitive Holocaust movie. Mm. I think that's where they're going with it. Yeah. Let's move on. Let's um, move on. Don't mo make this movie. Don't make this movie. A movie that is in production and got its uh, title reveal this week was the sequel to Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, which is called Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald. Why is Fantastic Beasts in that title? I don't know. Other than that, like, like sequel, whatever. But it's like, I love that they just, like, 
Fantastic Beasts, colon, like... It is a spectacularly bad title. Not that that really matters for the quality of the movie, but, like... Yeah. It just it sounds like the title for, like, an animated, like, direct-to-DVD spin-off yes. movie, you know? Uh, it sounds like, you know, J.K. Rowling turned in her script, and then a bunch of marketing interns at Warner Brothers came up with a really bad focus group-tested title. Yeah. Um, but anyway, they also released a cast photo... Which, you know, you pan left to right across the cast photo, and there's some cool stuff. You've got Jude Law as young Dumbledore, and uh, he looks cool. Like, he has a, a beard that has not turned white yet. It's, like, brown. He's got the robes. He actually looks much more like a young Dumbledore than I thought he would, so I like that. You've got all your returning characters from the last movie, like Eddie Redmayne and Catherine Waterston. You've got some new faces. And then you get all the way over to the right, uh -huh. and you remember, oh, right, Johnny Depp is in this piece of shit. And it's only a piece of shit because of Johnny Depp. Because here's the thing. I liked Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. I'm a huge Harry Potter fan. I thought it was a pretty cool spinoff movie until the last five minutes when you take Colin Farrell, who's a really good actor, and you reveal that he was actually playing Grindelwald the whole time. Spoilers. And under his yeah, mask. Like, that means fucking nothing, John. I, I know. Oh, he was Grindelwald the whole time. I watched every single Harry Potter movie. I have no idea what the fuck that means. I don't think Grindelwald's in the movies. But anyway... um, and you get to the end, and it was Johnny Depp the whole time. And not just, like, Johnny Depp, but Johnny Depp in really awful, like, makeup that makes him look like Darth Vader at the end of Episode 6. And not only has is Johnny Depp still cast in this, even though he is a known wife beater, yeah. uh, and just general creep, I think. And I think in this cultural moment, that's a little weird, let's say. Um, they have doubled down on the weird makeup. He looks just completely alien. And I don't get it. Like, one, the whole point of doing the Grindelwald story is that in the they're adapting a big thing from book seven that is not in the movies, which is this series of Dumbledore flashbacks. And Grindelwald is an interesting part of the Harry Potter kind of mythos because he's like the much more human-scale Voldemort in that he did some bad stuff and Dumbledore was the guy who put him down. Um, but he's like an earlier era as Voldemort, which is to say he's not nearly as evil and destructive as you know, the new variety we have now. And that's kind of the contrast. In fact, in the lore, like Grindelwald in the present day where he's imprisoned uh, and when Voldemort goes to visit him, Grindelwald has like remorse. He knows what he did was wrong. He's like living out his days in prison. All of that I think is an interesting way to go where if you're going to do a Harry Potter prequel and you're going to tell that story, I would want to lean into all those things that distinguish him from Voldemort. Instead, they got Johnny Depp uh -huh. who... Who is is not uh, Ray Fine? Let's just say that. Yeah. Uh, and slathered him in so much makeup that he looks like I don't know. He's an again. He looks like Darth Vader from the end of Episode Six or something. And it's like no, I cannot buy that as like the human counterpoint to Voldemort. I cannot buy that as the guy who was Dumbledore's best friend as a child. And uh, you know, if you consider J.K. Rowling's extended comments, gay lover. Like all of these things do not add up to Johnny Depp in makeup. And it just feels like they're shooting that movie in the foot before they've even had a chance to make it. I would love to be excited for this. I'm excited for all the other parts of it. It's J.K. Rowling writing the script again. She's a great writer. I want to see what she does with it. That casting of Johnny Depp for that, though, again, we have not seen the movie. Maybe it'll surprise me. But that is miscasting to me of the highest possible order. Do you think that Johnny Depp has a makeup fetish? Oh, yeah. Like, 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 it's just, he, ever since fucking Pirates, he just needs to be. Like, he's uh -huh. like, every single movie he's in, he has to be on just so much fucking makeup. Yeah. Even in, I saw the movie Murder on the Orient Express, which I keep forgetting right. to talk about. It's pretty good. It's better than you've heard. Cool. Um, and uh, Johnny Depp is the guy who gets murdered in it, so you don't have to deal with him for long. That's even, the right casting decision. Even that, he's slathered in, like, fake scars and shit, and, like... Just, just be an actor. Like, I understand you need to be slathered in makeup to, to come at the end of the night. But do that on your own time. Yeah. You know? You've got the money. Yeah. Hire a makeup artist. Because, like, 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 every other person in the cast photo just looks like a normal yeah. person. Yeah, it's, it's crazy, but he just looks so off. Like, it looks like he's trying to dress up as David Lynch for Halloween and isn't quite there. <laughs> yeah, that's... David Lynch would be a better Grindelwald. Fucking yes he yes. would Yes he would That would be kind of amazing That'd David be... Lynch is young Dumbledore He's not particularly young But we're just gonna do it Also Johnny Depp isn't British Oh yeah And You know J.K. Rowling You sold out here You had a rule Hard and fast Throughout all seven Harry Potter movies The actors had to be British No American stunt casting You were okay with Dumbledore being Irish Cause that's cool 
but that is not a British citizen, and you shouldn't let him be in your movie. You know, be exclusionary. Just this once, Britain, yeah. be exclusionary. Where's the fucking Britain that passed Brexit, motherfucker? Yeah. That's what we need. What is Johnny Depp doing taking British jobs? Exactly. Ah, <sighs> pisses me off. Just, you know what? Let it be Jude Law plays both roles. I bet he'd be great at that. Sure. Yeah, That'd be kind of cool. excuse for all the makeup. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, Sean, let's talk about the last and most significant piece of news this week. Uh, at least in terms of entertainment dumb stuff. Yeah. Um, that we're talking about is uh, the Battlefront 2 loot box clusterfuck extraordinaire. Oh, uh, yeah. As of this writing, Battlefront 2, or as of this recording, has finally launched... But, like, one hour before the game formally launched, it was in EA Access, like, early access for several days, uh, EA put out a press release. They were suspending all in-game microtransactions. This came after several rounds of hot fixes trying to fix the economy in the game and making it really only more confusing because, as we talked about when you reviewed the beta, yep. uh, Battlefront 2, its entire progression system is based on random loot drops, uh-huh. um, which you could accelerate with money. But from everything we were seeing through press reporting... And and like fan reporting during the early access period, even dropping like upwards of $100 would guarantee you nothing because it's all randomized and weird. Um, so suffice it to say, the issue has not been fixed by taking the microtransactions down. And this was so significant that after the fact, we started hearing that Disney executives, up to and including Bob Iger, the CEO of Disney, called EA because they were outraged that this negative stigma was being attached to Star Wars through this, and they had no idea EA was going down this path. So this has reached the upper echelons of the Disney Corporation, who I'm pretty sure can legally kill whoever they want. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, they're not going to kill them. They're just going to send them to the Disney mines on the moon, you know. Yes. No, the same mines as in uh, Pinocchio where the donkeys are going. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, no, it's... EA's having a hell of a fucking year, man. Because also, just like, just a weird footnote, because nobody listening to this podcast knows this, that the new Need for Speed game came out two weeks ago. Yeah, no one knows that. (laughs) It just happened. It It just came out, got terrible reviews. Nobody gave a shit. Fun fact, it's the first game no one has ever bought. It's true, yeah. You cannot yeah. prove that anyone owns that game. It's yeah, no, it's 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 a hell of a thing. So yeah, EA is just from Mass Effect Andromeda to like the least exciting racing game <laughs> ever. The, like you said, the game that the video game that nobody bought. And so in some ways you kinda can't even prove that it exists, I guess. Yeah. Um, Schrodinger's game. Yeah. To them, you know, very publicly and disastrously shutting down one of their, like, prestige studios that made one of their most acclaimed, critically acclaimed franchises in the last 10 years with Visceral. And thus, like, like very publicly shutting down one of their major projects in development with the Star Wars license has been fighting, I like, what is to me, like, almost an unprecedented ongoing PR, like, debacle with Star Wars Battlefront 2 that has been simmering since the beta that, that I talked about. And then as like we've gotten closer and closer to release and there have been things like there was a press review event and then the early access period where if you had um, EA access or whatever it's called, you got to play like like an 18 hour version of the game or whatever it is. They're like complicated version of that shit. I think it was 10 hours. Yeah. They did the same thing for Battlefront 1. That's how I played yeah, it. Yeah, and got to play yeah that version of the game like a week or so before it officially came out, which was a couple of days ago of, as of the recording of this podcast because I think it came out on Friday. Because video games just come out on Fridays now. I've missed that memo. It just has just started happening. The Nintendo's done Friday. it for years. Now yeah. pe- other people are like following Nintendo's Yeah, because Wolfenstein 2 also came out on a Friday. It's just yeah. weird. But yeah, so Battle... So, and I guess kind of like the chain of events was... The beta came out, and everyone got their hands on the beta, and there were, obviously because it was a beta, that were, you couldn't buy the microtransactions, and there were limits to how like deep into the menus you could go, but as I talked about on this podcast when I played that beta, it seemed like the progression in the loot box stuff was really fucking terrible then, and then, you know, cut like a week or so after that, there was a review event that, you know, professional video game reviewers at major video game outlets went to this review event, and then it came out that, like, there were, like, screenshots that showed, like, some of the major heroes costing something in the round of, range of, like, 10,000 to 15,000 credits, which is already was a lot for the rate of, like, 200 or so credits that you were getting per match, like, not counting challenges you would complete. And then when people got ac- access to the early access version, they saw that, oh, like, if you wanted to play as Darth Vader, he cost, like, 60,000 credits which was way more than was at the review event, which already caused a lot of raised eyebrows about like, what the fuck does, what were you pulling there, EA? 
But then also people were doing the math and saying, like, you have to play, like, 40 fucking hours. Like, if ignoring, there were other ways to get credits, including microtransactions, but also, like, doing challenges. But if you were just playing the game and just, like, completing normal matches, it would take, like, tens of hours for you to be able to unlock Darth fucking Vader. Like... Which was, I saw a good comment somewhere that was basically equating that with, like, that would be like if you bought a new Dragon Ball game and you had to <laughs> fucking, like, play for ten hours to unlock Goku. Yes. Like, it's Darth Vader. that You should have Darth Vader unlocked from the beginning. You should just give me Darth Vader. I will unlock Darth Maul because he's a cool extra, you know. I will or Mon unlock... Calamari or something. Yes, that's a that's a species. You is that... Oh, it is. Yes. Okay. You fucking... you, I think you might be thinking of Mon Mothma. There. Well, I was either yeah. thinking of that or what's the little guy on Jabba's belly? Uh, oh, jeez, fuck. Uh, it'll come to me later, but yes, I know who you're talking about. Uh, so I here's what I'll repeat: the Mon Calamari, the general. Yes, um, Admiral Akbar. Admiral Akbar. You're trying yeah, to think of? yeah. Yes. Yeah, but you know, yeah, give me your weird sort of like more obscure characters like like Bosk, the bounty hunter, is one of the hero characters in the game, which is like you're really reaching when you have to go for fucking Bosk, the lizard dude from <laughs> from episode five. That's who Bosk is, if you were wondering who fucking Bosk is. Um But yeah, like and so everyone was like, Well, that's horse shit. Like, I don't want to have to play this like boring ass first person shooter forever. <laughs> For the chance to be able to play as fucking Darth Vader, who I should be able to just play as from the beginning. And so then EA cut, like, the prices for basically all of that shit in-game by, like, 75%. On But when, the, at the same time as they did that, they also decreased the amount of credits you got for completing the campaign by an equivalent 75%. <laughs> which was just, like, an unneeded fuck you. I have no idea who at EA decided to do that. That was the funniest headline I saw was, like... Why? Why would you do that? Why would you why would you cut how much it costs and how much you're getting for finishing the campaign? You fucking dicks. You have no idea what you're doing here. I think it's really impressive uh that Scrooge, uh Ebenezer Scrooge from a Christmas Carol is not only alive and real, but has lived from, you know, 20th century England to into his hundreds to be the CEO of EA. Yeah. It is truly incredible that, that he is running a video game company now. It is just, it is fucking absurd. And so then after that, where they had, they cut the prices for everything by 75%, like still people were like, this is horse shit. Partially because like the problem wasn't the prices. The problem wasn't like even having microtransactions of the game. The problem was like everything about how that progression system was designed from top to bottom was utter shit. Like, there's so much randomness in what you were getting. You had no agency in trying to aim yourself towards a specific goal. And also, you know, all the unlocks were... Well, not all the unlocks, but there were a lot of unlocks that had really sort of substantive impacts on the gameplay. Which is another big no-no, that it should have just been premier, like, uh, cosmetic stuff. Like, like an Overwatch, you know. Let me get a cool, weird, like, Darth Vader skin. Let me put, like, cool hot rod flames on Darth Vader, like... Just go this, weird with it. This is like a Call of Duty progression system, but turned utterly random. Exactly. Where like yeah. Call of Duty progression is, it makes you better at the game, but that's because it takes skill to like play it, and and it's a true progression system in that you can aim yourself towards what you want to do. Yeah, this you're was, not just like finishing three to four matches and getting enough in-game currency to buy a like box, and then you get like a red dot sight for a submachine gun that you never use, which is basically more well, or less the equivalent of what Battlefront Two is doing. But so, just so like all the, like so, the stuff that they were changing does not fix the problems with the progression at all. Like the problems with the progression could like take a lot more work in game design to actually fix those things. But they were getting so hammered with all of this shit from fans and the press that then they just said, and like, Disney executives and, and the Disney executives that they said fine and just threw their hands up in the air like we're taking the microtransactions out of the game like. Not, which, again, that doesn't change any of the fundamental issues of the progression system. That just means you can't spend real-life money on it. Which is, I guess, nice of them to be like, well, we're not going to like predatorily exploit uh, you know, people that have poor impulse control. But that doesn't fix your video game being shitty, I guess. I don't know if it's nice when it's because you got caught it's, openly. It's like, <laughs> Relatively speaking, it's nice in like the game of capitalism. Let's okay, say. sure. It's, you know, they didn't have to do that. They, they, they chose to do that to try to save face. But yeah, you know, it, no, Sean, they may have had to do that because Disney sure, called yes. them and probably said, we will pull the license if you don't stop this. Like, I, I think once you bring in, like, top brass at Disney, 
I don't know if you can say anything EA is doing is their own choice. That's a fair point, yeah. I mean, one... They're never getting this license again. They have fucked Star Wars yeah, too once thoroughly. That, yeah, once, once that, that contract runs out, runs out they are yeah, they, they are just, done, and they probably know it. I I just like to picture you know because we talked about I think it was on the last podcast we talked about the 20th Century Fox things that were going around, and I like the idea of CEO Andrew Wilson who looks like the the like a villain like a corporate villain from a video game. You've seen him on on the E3 press conference stage, like getting pulled into a room and sat down in a chair, and then Mickey Mouse turns around at the other <laughs> side of the big lavish chairs. Like, I will fucking own you, motherfucker! You will fix this shit. <laughs> He's petting a cat while he does it too. No, it's... do you have any idea how much moon mines we or cheese mines we have on the moon? <laughs> Where's there's a spot waiting for you, Andrew? Someone needs to make that animated short. <laughs> yeah, they break his kneecaps. No, it's... Not that I'm... You shouldn't do that. That's a Mickey Mouse joke. No. Because the, the, the one wrong part of all the fan reaction is there's no reason to threaten anyone with violence, internet. Yeah. But getting back to EA stupidity, like, here's my number one reaction to all this, Sean. I, I was teaching a class the other night when I saw this going down, like, on my Twitter in between, like, every hour I would check it. And it was just like, this is crazy. And my number one reaction is just, Star Wars shouldn't be this hard. And I know it's a huge franchise, and there's a hundred people's hands in the pot, and it's there's a lot of different pressures. Still, it's Star Wars. Yeah. There are laser swords, and blaster guns, and cool characters. You can make it work. It's not. This is not like something no one's ever done in video games and successfully monetized before. Yeah. Like, LucasArts and LucasFilm successfully did this internally for decades without fucking it up. Like, EA, you have had the license for three years, and you are constantly tripping over your own dick. It's insane yeah. how bad they are at this. Like, I cannot believe all of this made it through all these different levels of EA command with no one saying, what if this goes south and Disney gets mad at us because we will be putting them in a PR nightmare one month before the release of their biggest film of the year? Yeah. Like, really? That didn't cross your mind? That being predatory towards fans might not be the best look right before they're releasing their, like, you know, flagship film of the year? Huh. You guys yeah. are really bad at this. Yeah. It's just... I don't know what else to say. I thought Jason Schreier had a pretty good um, tweet reaction, which was like... I think... Because I think it was like a little bit before the news came yeah. out that EA was pulling the microtransactions. He just said, like, I think that EA is... Like, rumor is that EA is about to pull an Xbox One... And that's, like, the only thing I can think of in video games that is, like, equivalent to this is the Xbox One debacle, like, pre-launch of yeah. all the weird, draconian, insane, specific rules about, like, how online and used games and all that shit would work that they had to strip out of the console a couple of months before launch that handicapped their console for years. And they're still trying to, like, Xbox One X is them trying to dig themselves out of that hole that they made from, like, really shitty PR and, like... This is that with EA. I'm really curious to see how this is going to impact the sales of Battlefront 2. Because while Battlefront 1 was a shit game, it still sold well because it was Star Wars. I don't know if this one is going to sell well just because it's Star Wars, you know? Uh, I think it will put the phrase, all press is good press, to the test. Sure, yes. <laughs> because yeah. it's getting a hell of a lot of attention, but negative. Here's a here's a, one little anecdote I can share about this. Okay. This is, you know, this is not statistical. I have no way to back up if this is a larger trend. While I was at Best Buy uh, yesterday, trading in a couple of games to buy Pokemon Ultra Sun, the people at the counter next to me were returning their copy of Battlefront 2 angrily. Okay. <laughs> That's and, it was good. A, and it was a family with like their little kid who was very disappointed in Battlefront 2. It's like, like it's like they're showing him a calculator. It's like, this is how long it would take to unlock Darth Vader. It's Darth Vader. Like, yeah. it's Darth fucking Vader. What? Again, that's my point. Star Wars shouldn't be that hard. If someone needs to tell you that Darth Vader shouldn't be behind an insane paywall... You're not doing it right. Yeah, because that was like before all the, like the specific like them pulling microtransactions thing. That was the thing I found the most disheartening because if you remember my dis like the takeaway of the beta, the only fun I had in that game was running around as Darth Maul in one multiplayer match. So that was like the thing. I was like, well, that was pretty fun. And then seeing that most of the characters I wanted to play as like Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker would take a huge amount of playing that game to unlock. I was like, well. 
any like inkling of like interest I have in this game is basically gone because you've basically can't like kneecapped the one part of the game that I actually enjoyed and would have enjoyed of like playing the other characters. They should just get uh, a new Lego Star Wars game out every year. Those aren't controversial. They're not great, but you know, no one will get mad at it. Yeah, sure. Do that. So, Sean, transitioning from one uh, gigantic corporate clusterfuck to another. <laughs> yeah, it's do a want, good segue, huh? Do you want to talk about Justice League? Oh, do we want to talk about Justice League? Okay, so, Sean. This movie's not good, Jonathan. Um. I don't care about spoilers, but I don't want to make anyone angry. So quickly, spoiler-free reaction. It's a piece of shit. What do you think? It's just like, like to, to bring a certain amount of nuance to that reaction, which I totally agree with the it's a piece of shit reaction. But it's, you know, there are lots of different ways that movies can be pieces of shit. And this one is just so boring. It's just it's a so boring. profoundly boring movie. It has... Like, one of the most, like, loose fucking plot structures I've ever seen. Like, that, it's kind of like the whole movie just feels like Act 1. Like, it just feels like they've never found a way to, like, transition out of Act 1 of the movie. So it just drags and drags and drags and drags and drags. There's huge amounts of exposition all throughout the movie as they, like, desperately try to introduce, and like, every single character. And, and try to give most of them a character arc. They, they, they left Aquaman behind. They couldn't figure out any, like, not even, like, the loosest character arc for Aquaman. I think I... You t- could edit Aquaman out of the movie and nobody would notice. I think I tweeted this, and it is, I'm not, this is not an exaggeration joke. Every time it cut back to Aquaman, I had forgotten he was in the movie. I had the exact Every same, time. Like, yeah, even to the point where it's, like, you're in the climactic fight scene, and it's, like, it's Aquaman does something, and then it cuts to, like, Batman and Wonder Woman are doing something, and then it cuts back to Aquaman, and you're like, oh, right, Aquaman's in this movie. It would literally be that short of an interval, and I would forget that he was there, because he has no reason to be there. He has no he's, presence in that movie at all. He's like one of those, he's like the Doctor Who villain, The Silence, where you cannot remember them unless you're yeah. looking at him. It is. It feels exactly like that. So it's like dull, unmemorable characters. Even like returning characters like Wonder Woman, I think, are Wonder Woman is not that interesting in this movie. They also give her some character stuff. Oh, that, they sell Wonder Woman down the river, and it is some sexist bull. Yeah, there's. They make some choices with Wonder Woman that are confusing to say the most. They wholesale rip off in a like really blazing way. The opening scene to Fellowship of the Ring, in a way, they do. <laughs> I in a way I was like confounded. It's not the first scene in the movie is a rip off of the first scene of Fellowship of the Ring, but about halfway through the movie, yeah. they just beat for beat rip off the entire opening from Fellowship of the Ring in a way that I was really perplexed by, that I was no way expecting, and it's just it, it feels like a movie that is exactly what it is, which is a massive like jumble of shit that a movie corporation had all these things that it wanted and needed to be put into a movie and it had one director working on it that had to leave the project for personal reasons and had another director come on to try to finish the movie for him and that sounds like a disaster recipe for a movie Let's be clear. and this is exactly that movie to remake the movie for him yes. the movie was they shot the movie it was yeah. to to fix the movie yeah. um Here's and the then thing. forced it into being like mercifully under two hours, but in no way should this movie have been under two hours for like the sake of itself. But also, like Thor Ragnarok is ten minutes longer than this movie. Justice League feels twice as long. Oh, absolutely! It is so fucking boring, and I don't want to forget that in this conversation. My number one reaction to Justice League was, "Good God, kill me! This is boring." Yes, not as much. So, here's the thing. So, my spoiler-free reaction, real quick. Um, I understand the sentiment that is out there that at least it's better than Batman v Superman and Suicide Squad. I'll give you that on Suicide Squad. I haven't seen Suicide Squad. So. Suicide Squad is the worst movie I've ever seen, so it is better than that. I would <laughs> okay. watch Justice League again first because... But here's the thing. It is better than Batman v Superman in some ways in that it did not cause visceral anger from me. Like nothing yeah. other than some of the stuff where they sell Wonder Woman down the river and I'm just like, I can't believe six months after Wonder Woman you guys fucked this up that bad yeah. that no one caught that. But anyway, other than that, did not cause me visceral anger. But I think this has, like go down the list of every flaw in Batman v Superman this movie has them. It has almost every one of them. It is not as overtly fascist, but right. other than that, it is. Uh, but it's complete... like it's only less overtly fascist because it has nothing to say about anything. Like yes. it has no core theme or yeah. like idea. Yeah. Like at least Batman v Superman had a core theme and idea. It was just a reprehensible one. Yes, and so I do also understand the people saying like, well, 
at least Batman v Superman had like a central voice. And I would say true with the asterisk that there's also the scene where Wonder Woman sits down at a laptop and watches previews for every other movie. Yeah. I don't, I, that, that's just corporate malfeasance. So anyway, um, but like Batman v Superman is an incomprehensible plot. Justice League is an incomprehensible plot. Batman v Superman has bland and misinterpreted characters all over the place. Justice League has that. It's it's like it, it, uh, Batman v Superman is all CGI barf that is visually incomprehensible. Justice League is even worse at that. Like its yeah. action is much worse than Batman v Superman. Like I would not say this is an appreciably better movie than Batman v Superman. It's just a movie that made me less angry. Yeah, it's a less offensive one. Yeah. Uh, and like at least 50% of that is that it's half an hour shorter. Yeah. Half an hour to a full hour shorter, depending on what cut of Batman v Superman you're talking about. Well, I'm looking forward to the epic Justice League real version that they'll release on DVD that's four hours long and nobody can survive it. Yeah. Um, it's like the ring. <laughs> if yes. you watch it, you die. No. Uh, okay. Spoilers from here on out. Superman's alive! Yeah. Spoilers! He comes back. So, Sean, I, uh... You know, I was excited for Justice League on the level of I was so curious of what this movie would be. Sure, Not yeah. excited in that I thought it was going to be good. One of the things I was so curious about was how are they going to bring back Superman? Because they're clearly going to do it. He's going to be in the movie. What do they... There's that thing where he, the, the dirt is levitating off the grave right, at the end yes. of Batman v Superman. Because so, that's the Superman's unknown superpower is he can levitate small particles yeah. of dirt. So I thought it was just going to be something like he was never actually dead. He needed time in the ground and then he comes back out or something. Did you at a million expect the plot of the middle act of Justice League would be they would exhume Superman's body. They would dig it up while Flash and Cyborg are having their little heart-to-heart -heart while digging up the dead body of another character. Throw it in a vat of chemicals and then use a mother box. And then just leave the mother box there for Steppenwolf to come get. There's a lot of bad and baffling shit in Justice League. By far the most baffling part of this movie to me is all the stuff around Superman's resurrection. In part because Henry Cavill is more CGI than man in this movie. And I'm not just talking about the mustache removal. His it's whole funny, body is CGI for large swaths of this movie and it makes no sense. That entire part where they're resurrecting Superman is almost entirely shot across against green screens. It's clearly a huge part of the reshoots like... That clearly was not part of the original story because it comes the fuck out of nowhere. Like, just in the middle of one scene, Batman is like, could we use a mother box to resurrect Superman? And no one tries to talk him out of that. And then they do it, and he's kind of angry, but then he's not. And then they're on CGI Kansas, and there's a weird scene with Amy Adams, who is really sad to have to be in this movie. And it's Her just, contract has to run out at some point, right? She is just thinking in every scene... At least this will pay for my child's college. At least yeah. this will pay for... They can go to Harvard now. I won't have to pay a dime. Like, it is baffling. And that's just one of the things... Because mostly I've already forgotten this movie. I cannot forget that weird set of scenes in the middle that maybe scarred me a little inside. I mean, it is something of where... It's one of the the number of places where this movie is kind of like dead on arrival. It's like it's, it's already fucked. Yeah. Is that bringing Superman back, they just decide to have to do it in a really circuitous, ridiculous manner that is takes a huge amount of plot effort and time to get that to happen for what like is like very little benefit because you re realize the whole time that like nobody gives a shit about this version of Superman. I so do like I'm a huge Superman fan. I own three separate Superman t-shirts. I'm a big fucking Superman fan. I should be super fucking stoked about going to a movie that has Superman in it, right? Yeah, you're wearing a Captain America shirt tonight. Like, two out of every three podcasts, he has a Superman shirt on. It's a big deal for me. I love Superman. I am so done with this version of Superman. He is I so can't. boring. I can't even be the, like, well, at least Henry Cavill looks like Superman. Like, no. no. All of it is bad. The writing is bad. The performance is bad. The direction is bad. The idea is bad. Everything about this version of Superman has been bad since Man of Steel. I think Henry Cavill had a spark in Man of Steel, if not a full performance, that spark has been driven out of him with a sledgehammer. Yeah. And this is the most nothing boring wet noodle of a performance I have ever seen in one of these movies. He has like five lines in the film. He has no personality whatsoever. Joss Whedon is uh, doing the worst writing of his entire career. Uh -huh. yeah. Especially with Superman's uh, dialogue. Like love or hate Joss Whedon. He has never written anything this inert. 
with uh-huh. characters, and especially with Superman. He and just every time Ben Affleck or someone else in this movie talks about Superman, they're describing a character we have never seen and will not see in this movie. His powers make no fucking sense. I it's they have to power down the rest of the Justice League to make it seem like they need Superman at all. Just it's horrible. And Henry Cavill being literally CGI for half of his performance kind of just tells you all you need to know. It is a plastic action figure that a child with no imagination is playing with. Yeah. And so that being one of the core cruxes around which the plot of this movie has to revolve because they fucking killed Superman at the end of the last movie is just so unbelievably detrimental to this movie that, it, like, it's, again, it's dead on arrival. Like, it's it's over before it even started yeah. because... Because you would have to, like, you needed to bring Superman back in, like, the first scene or the second scene of this movie. Like, you had to bring him back almost immediately for, like, for this movie to work at all, in my opinion. And instead, they wait until what I guess we call as the second act of this movie, which is them trying to bring Superman back to life. I would love so somebody try to describe to me what the three, the act breaks are in this movie. Because I would say it doesn't have them, not because it's being artsy and edgy, because it's utterly incompetent as a piece of filmmaking. Yeah. So, like, like, let's talk about some of that stuff. Because for me, that's almost maybe the biggest core issue with the movie is that the plot structure is just utterly fucked. It's gibberish. It, because, yeah, because it's a team-up movie. And team-up movies generally have exactly one plot structure. And that is Act 1. The team is separate. And then by the end of Act 1, they come together in a loose coalition. Act 2, they face some sort of complication that makes them have to rethink themselves and, and splits the group apart, either like literally or psychologically. Act 3, they have to come back together and re-resolve as another group and overcome the complication from Act 2. And by the end of the movie, they are reformed as a solid group that has overcome the main conflict. That is the plot to every single team-up movie. It's the plot to the Avengers. It's the plot to Guardians of the Galaxy. It's the plot to fucking all of them. It's the plot to Seven Samurai. It's the plot, yes, it's, it's the plot to all of them, just in a very broad way, because that's basically what you need to do in like the time of the length of time that a movie takes. If you have this idea of like we want a movie that is about a group of people that have to work together to overcome a like a, con- a crisis together and overcome differences with each other to form a team, that is the plot structure that that story is almost certainly going to have to. Abide by by to fit within two to three hours of a movie right yes and as i said with ea and star wars it just shouldn't be this hard to get that right yeah. it is you have more than enough examples of how you put this together and uh we're going to mention joss whedon a lot because his fingerprints are clearly all over oh, this yeah, absolutely the first draft we do have to remember was written by chris terrio who is Amazingly unqualified to write superhero movies He's a decent writer for dramas Like he won an Oscar for writing the movie Argo That's his background Is writing like, you know Kind of prestige drama crime films kind of things He was utterly inept writing Batman v Superman And he's even more inept here And that's part of the mess I think they're cleaning up On screen before our eyes here Is that this guy does not know how to write a genre movie to, to save his life It's one of Maybe he's a good writer Outside of this I have I didn't really like Argo either But like It is amazing That they have stuck they, they let him write this movie And like There are a million people Who can write a comic book movie Yes They're They're called comic book writers Yeah They've been doing this shit Forever They've like, been making this Basic plot structure work Since the fucking 30s dude Yeah This So I'm just It's that bafflement also of like It's not hard Throw a rock in Hollywood and you can find someone who would write a better version of this movie. Yeah. Because what ends up happening is the reason why earlier I said that it feels like the whole movie is act one is because the team doesn't actually get together until the last scene of the movie. Yeah. It's not until the final climactic action sequence that the entire Justice League is assembled because it takes the whole fucking movie to get Superman there. And it's like that's... You can't do that because the team doesn't have a dynamic. If Superman has not been a part of the team... There's no team dynamic there. If they haven't, like, all had to face some complication that made them split up, that they had to then do soul-searching and come back together to find a reunified purpose, then you don't have, like, the core dramatic plot moment that you need to make the team fucking function as a team and earn your, like, hero shot at the end of the movie. Like, the you know, the classic Avengers, you know, them all standing in a circle and the camera going around them. That movie earns that shot because you've seen those characters, each one of those characters go on an, uh, their own small character arc that, that matches the overall plot arc of the movie to get them to that point where they're now unified against the, the fucking Chitauri invasion. 
this movie, they never get to have that moment because they took the whole movie to fucking get Superman there. And even if you kind of take that out and just focus on like the other five who are in all the marketing and yes, all that, yeah. they don't even do those basic steps with those five. Exactly. Like what this movie is, is... And again, I'm surprised that for all the money and time, and especially money, because this movie cost over $300 million before marketing, that they put into fixing this after the poor reaction to Batman v Superman, this follows pretty much the exact plot structure I would have predicted after Batman v Superman. They learned nothing, which is that Batman and Wonder Woman have files for the other Justice League members, they realize there's a threat, they go ask them to come together, they come together, they fight... And then they fight some more. Like, there is no conflict within. The most they argue is that Wonder Woman puts up a very feeble argument against Batman uh, for resurrecting Superman. But then they don't fight about it or anything. Yeah. No one ever comes into genuine conflict. They resurrect Superman. He's off with very sad Amy Adams. And then they go start the final battle. Like, it's so robotic and mechanical and nothing that even with those five, there's no group dynamics. Yeah. You know, some performances pop here and there. Sure. But not anything between people. Like, the most laughable part of the entire movie to me is post credit scene number one, where Superman and the Flash have a race, and it's like, yeah. you did not earn this. Yeah, you they've had, even... like, fucking, I guess they've had two moments together. One is when Superman beat the shit out of the Flash... Earlier in the movie, and two is when when Superman flew next to Flash later in the movie. You cannot, that's the two character moments they had. No, you cannot have that scene if you do, like again. Henry Cavill probably has more dialogue in that post credit scene than he has in the movie proper. Oh, absolutely. This doesn't. I mean, these are just basic storytelling things that I cannot believe anyone in Hollywood is this inept. Yeah. To let this out because because. The, like the beginning of the movie, going back to some of like the act structure stuff, is you it has some of the stuff you would expect of like oh each hero kind of gets a scene, but there's something a weird element of it that it feels like a lot of those scenes are like would have been the post credit scene of like the Flash movie or the Aquaman movie yeah. is Batman is like like what the post credit scene of Iron Man was, which is Nick Fury shows up and is like oh we need to talk about the Avengers initiative. You would think that's like a lot of those scenes feel like. Oh, at the end of the Flash movie, the Flash like were to like you know smash the credits like oh that was awesome he beat Captain Cold whatever the Flash movie would be and then you know the, after the sort of like the midway half of the credit sequence because that's what we do today because we have to have fucking two of them and I never stay for the second one I just read what it was on the internet because I'm not fucking bothered with that shit I'm tired of that now did you stay for the one for Thor? Um, yes. Because it was Jeff Goldblum. Yes, good. yeah. I did the one for Thor, but that's because I was a good movie. So yes, that's worthy. true. But, you know, for that Flash one, it's like, yeah, after the smash credits with, a, with nice design credits that have some, like, fully produced song, and then it's like, <laughs> the Flash returns home, turns on the light, and then Bruce Wayne is sitting on the chair, it's like, oh, and then, like, Bruce Wayne throws the thing, and it's like, oh, you're Batman, and that's like, and back to credits until yeah. the end where it's like some throwaway joke. That's what those scenes feel like. And that's not a way to build a movie. No, and it's actually the worst part of the movie to me is the first 45 minutes yeah, or so. Yeah, because it's all just exposition that's like completely it's, detached from everything else. Yeah, it's just, and this is exactly what Batman v Superman does, is you jump from place to place to place to place, and sometimes you come back to characters you know, but never in one setting that like evolves and grows over the course of the film. It's just they're running around the globe, and they're doing different things, and nothing builds on anything else. And I think describing them as like a series of post credit scenes, it totally feels like that. Like Bruce Wayne on a horse in, in the Arctic. For one, continuity makes no sense there, because he's uh -huh. clean-shaven, then he has a beard, then he has to shave again, and they have Ben Affleck shaving, so at least they caught it. But it's like, yeah, that clearly was from a different version of this movie. That feels like a post credit scene. Him going and meeting the Flash feels like a post credit scene. Some of the stuff in Themyscira, I don't know what it feels like, but it doesn't feel like part of this movie. It's just a different movie. It's, it's just, just Lord just, of the Rings. Yeah, it's just the Lord of the Rings, and uh, it's, it's just you cut from place to place to place, and I'm just like, give me something to care about. Yeah. Give me a character. You know, like... Again, like I think a good one to compare this to is The Avengers because it's a very prototypical team-up movie and uh, has a key creative in key with both of yeah. these doing some of the best and then some of the worst work of his career. And yeah, and obviously like the whole inspiration of doing Justice League in some ways is that yeah. Avengers was as successful as it was. Yes, and there's a Greek tragedy aspect to this we'll get to um, in the money department. But yeah, like The Avengers, the first act of that movie, it does have you know different places and characters to go to, but it quickly starts putting 
putting people together all towards a common goal. Yeah. So they're heading in the same direction, and you have these points where things intersect, like when Captain America, Iron Man, and Loki all fight in the forest or something. Yeah. Um, or, sorry, and Thor all fight in the forest, and then they get Loki. Or, you know, like, you, you have, like, you kind of have the team getting together and then going off on Yeah, places. and, like, having Black Widow go to meet Hulk and, like, pairing them up because yeah. they have a couple of important scenes together. Later. Yeah, and it's not like you keep cutting back to where the Hulk is hiding out over and over for different like little more morsels of exposition everything is moving forward from one scene to the next so it feels like there's active momentum yeah uh, and that's still my like my least favorite stretch of the Avengers because it's it's just it's necessary it's, it's, yeah, you it's have just like moving there. the pieces yeah. to get to the actual meat of the movie but that's like the platonic ideal for you know a mainstream blockbuster of what that is that works very well this is nothing yeah and one of the I think one of the major reasons why it's like this is that or why it like feels as dull and tedious as it is, is partially because they they I think they needed to pick a POV character or like yeah. a prime PO, a primary POV character. Like the Avengers doesn't really it kind of has two. I think it's like mostly Captain America and Black Widow are kind of the two major POV characters in terms of like the characters that you kind of anchor the movie around. Um, but I want to think one of the reasons why the Avengers gets away with not needing a strong sort of like pseudo audience surrogate or sort of like linchpin protagonist character for the group to kind of focus around is that we know most of those characters already from the other movies. So they kind of have gotten a lot of the work that you need that POV character for out of the way. Because one of the things that having this like strong POV kind of character to introduce you into this larger cast gives you is that it gives you a nice clear lens through which you can develop the other characters and not this big abstract space at which you need to develop every single character against every single other character to try to build the group dynamic if you have this sort of focal point character you just have to contrast them all with that focal point character and i think a good version of that you can see is guardians of the galaxy one is that's what they do with peter quill Peter Quill is like the focal point character. He's the primary protagonist of that movie. The majority of that movie has him in like in those scenes. And when he's not in a scene, it's very distinct and clear that he's not in the scene and why he's not in the scene. And that gives the scene a specific feel. And the team builds around him and that gives a focus to the movie because they have to introduce a lot of characters in that movie. And it would have been really fucking hard if in Guardians of the Galaxy 1 they're cutting from like young Peter Quill on Earth to like Rocket Raccoon somewhere out in space and then like Groot is somewhere else and Gamora is somewhere else and it's just like, you know, trying to develop all that shit simultaneously in all the different spots. You don't do that because that's a crazy fucking way to structure a movie and this movie has two characters that would have been fucking perfect they have the flash and they have cyborg either like pick one of them the flash is a young superhero who has little experience that is excited about like getting into taking his first steps into this bigger world like spider-man from civil war style and they come the closest with him to like he develops. Yes. I don't they don't do it well. They come the closest. Yes, but that he has the semblance of a character arc that is that framework. That's a fantastic character arc for a protagonist character in this movie to have. And then Cyborg is on the flip side, he's the reluctant hero who has has these powers but not by choice. And he also is directly connected to the primary antagonist of the movie because he's built from the same technology. What a great, perfect, fucking, like, custom-built character on a silver platter you have been given to be the, like, the point-of-view character to build this team around where Batman shows up on his doorstep one day and you see him have to, like, reject the call and then, like, you know, you get a little bit of hero's journey in there for the fans. Like, you just get, like, it's so perfect for that. But they don't do that. Like, the closest you get is Batman, and he's the worst character to do that with because he's supposed to be, like, the, like, gruff old leader of the team that is kind of phasing out. Yeah, no, and, like, Batman is mechanically our that, that, that function in that he is the primary mover of things early in the film. Not to the degree that you would need even to make this cohesive. Yeah. Just he has the most... He is at the he center goes of to the, the most Because he goes to see Aquaman and he goes to see Flash. Wonder Woman only goes to see Cyborg. So just by sheer math, yeah. Batman is more important. Yeah, it's... But yeah, no one is at the center of this movie. And it's it's very... And it's just, it has no center. It has no yeah. theme or idea or overall arc. It's just a series of scenes that kind of clash horribly. Yeah, and since we don't know anything about the majority of the team, and in particular... Like, Aquaman and Cyborg are not particularly well-known characters, and their version of Aquaman is super different than the comic version of Aquaman. So it's like, you need to develop those characters. 
Nobody has any idea who the fuck Cyborg is. And everybody who has any idea about who Aquaman is, they have a very different idea of who Aquaman is. You yeah. need to develop those characters to give them some place in the movie. And they just don't. I mean, they kind of, they, Cyborg has a tiny little semblance of a character arc. The Flash has a tiny little semblance of a character arc. They, they say in a couple of lines of dialogue that Wonder Woman has, I guess. We'll talk about that. A character that is at yeah. utterly at odds with the end of her solo movie. Exactly, yeah. And then Batman doesn't... Like, Batman's, like, static for the whole fucking movie. And then Aquaman is there. Aquaman is there. Let's talk about Aquaman. Like, Let's from a mechanical Aquaman. standpoint of how you move characters around in the movie, here's Aquaman's scenes in the film. Yeah. Is that Bruce goes to meet him, gets nowhere with Aquaman, Aquaman takes off his shirt and goes into the ocean. Yeah. And uh, Aquaman also outs Bruce as Batman right in front of, like... 15 fucking Icelanders, which really annoyed me. There's just like, they're walking outside and talking, and he's, you know, Batman's not in a costume. He just looks like Bruce Wayne, and Aquaman just looks at him and says, Well, Batman! And like, right while they're walking past two people who are literally like looking at them and following them with their heads, I'm like, what? Did well, nobody even like pay attention when they were making this movie? You don't do that. You just gave away his fucking secret identity. It's Batman. It's this weird nothing of a scene where you get no real sense of who Aquaman is a character, no sense of what he would add to the team, and maybe most importantly, no sense of what the fuck his powers are. Because uh -huh. at least with the other characters, like Cyborg is dull, I get a sense of what he can do visually. Right. Don't get that with Aquaman, and then he swims away. And then the only other time we see him before he comes and rescues them in the sewers in the middle of the movie in a completely incoherent series of action scenes where yeah. they go underground and all this stuff uh, is there's one scene in Atlantis where he's there and Amber Heard is playing Mira. Mira. Yeah. And the mother box gets stolen because everyone is bad at guarding their mother boxes. And... Uh, yeah, that's it. And yeah. Aqu we do we get no sense of like Aquaman's society or his role in the world. It's just he's there when the mother box gets stolen, and that's it. And something is important about his mother, and yeah. like that's that is maybe one of the most incomprehensible scenes I've ever seen in a movie. Is is Aquaman going back to Atlantis? And I'm someone who has like a I'm not a big Aquaman fan, but I feel like I have a decent enough idea of who Aquaman is, way more than the average moviegoer. And I was left I was that scene like. I, wait, who's Aquaman's mom again? Is Aquaman's mom the human? Because Aquaman's half human and half Atlantean. Or is she a, the queen of Atlantis? Or is like... I had no fucking idea what the point of that scene was. What they were trying to communicate. Other than, I guess, to like say, like, Aquaman, you have to go actually join Batman now. I guess. Nothing. But, like, but you don't seem... But Aquaman doesn't seem to give a shit about Atlantis. I don't know, because he wasn't particularly upset about the fact that, like, fucking 15 Atlanteans were just murdered right there. It, it's, it's like, I thought you were supposed to be the Prince of Atlantis. I have no idea. I have no fucking idea what was trying to be communicated by that Atlantis scene other than to, like, vaguely gesture Aquaman back to be on the team. It's like, you could have just had him join the team when Batman showed up at the beginning of the movie. And nobody would have noticed. So by the time Aquaman comes to save them and join the team, we don't know what his powers are. We don't know a lot about his personality. We don't know his place in the world. We know we have not seen him opposite any other member of the team other than not even Batman, like Bruce Wayne yeah. in, with a beard for like three seconds. That's it. And then he's back and he just kind of hangs around for the rest of the movie. By comparison, like, The Flash seems like, you know, this this great deep arc. Uh -huh. It's just, because there's just these, like, and it's not. It's terrible. But it's so much better than fucking Aquaman in this movie. Yeah, at least we understand that, like, The Flash has a motivation of that his dad is in jail. And he wants to get, like, a proper job and get his dad out of jail. Yeah. Like, they at least, that scene where The Flash goes to the jail to meet his dad, that scene communicates properly what it was trying to communicate. Yeah, I mean, The Flash is the best part of this movie. I Sure, yeah. Is I that fair? That. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so let's do the opposite of that. Okay. So we had Aquaman. Let's talk about The Flash. Because, you're right, I, I don't think any of it is great, but you do have the clear signposting of, like, here is The Flash. He's kind of like this kid who doesn't know what he's doing with his life. His dad is in prison for murdering his mom. It's all just from the first season of the recent Flash TV series, so it feels repetitive to me, but whatever. Right. Um, you know, his dad wants him to move on with his life. He doesn't. We see where he's living. Batman comes and offers him a chance to kind of do something in the world. The Flash is eager to do that. We see him use his powers. At one point in the movie, you know, The Flash is kind of afraid of, like, what should I do in this scenario? Batman tells him, you know, and it's this is the only line in the movie I would say approaches being a 
a good line is just save one person. It's yeah. like, okay, you needed to develop that more, but that's the start of something. Yeah. And so he has that, and by the end, he's like an active hero participant. The skeleton of that is fine. It's not great. It's not bad. It's fine. I think you need to build on it for it to become good. Yeah, again, like, if he was the, like... POV character basically sure. and that was how you were introduced to the rest of the team and you and you had that like sense of progression of oh you know he starts out and in the first scene it's just like just save one person and then by the end of the movie he's saving everybody like then it would be a satisfying character arc but that's so buried under oh, all yeah. this bullshit yeah. that it doesn't surface at all yeah because it's the skeleton of like the Flash's own story that then is buried under all these other half stories yeah I would say the Flash is the only one who gets like a full beginning middle end arc yeah I would agree it also helps Ezra Miller is I do think good in this I like sure, him a lot yeah. I like Ezra Miller in general I thought he was charming and funny even if a lot of his dialogue was kind of horrible. Yeah. But like... I think it, it fluctuated scene to scene for me because I think the quality of the dialogue was questionable most of the time. Um, but I liked Ezra Miller. Like, if you got the right people to make a Flash movie with him, I would maybe watch that. Yeah, sure, yes. Um, yeah, if, there was a, if it was a good script and a good director, I would yeah. absolutely watch a movie with him as the Flash. Yeah, he seemed like a good casting. That said, two other things about how they do the Flash in this. Okay, yeah. I, just, I have a couple. The costume is terrible. One, how did he get it? Yes, yes. Just exactly, that. Yeah. But also, like, the whole point of the Flash versus other superheroes is that he's these he's this tall, skinny, lanky kid. Like he is the like like little guy's superhero. You know, he's like if you were ever like the skinny kid in gym class who was picked on because you couldn't really throw the ball, that's your superhero, is right. the Flash. And, like, look at how, for instance, Grant Gustin's costume works on the CW Flash So where it's a cool costume and it also looks like it would protect him from different situations, but it also accentuates that Grant Gustin is a tall, skinny kid. Like, and so it looks like the costume that kind of person would wear. The Ezra Miller Flash costume is just Batman's costume, but red. It's this giant, like, bulky, fascistic again, like, power armor, like, bulletproof power armor, and it looks ridiculous. Ridiculous on Ezra Miller, who is this tall, skinny, lanky kid. It does nothing, like just in basic costume design, it's bad costume design because it does not accentuate the actor's body yeah. in the right way. And I don't mean accentuate it like sexually, I mean like, you know, accentuate like that this is what Ezra Miller looks like, you yeah. know? It does nothing to do that. The other thing is, I think, uh, you know, Zack Snyder, Joss Whedon, whatever mixture of directors did this, the way they visualize his powers is awful. The, the flash way he runs looks so dumb. It looks so dumb, and because every second of it is done in super slow mo, he looks like he's running about two miles an hour in this yeah. whole movie. There is no one shot where you get a sense that he is actually moving fast. This is kind of like how Joss Whedon visualized Quicksilver in um, the Avengers: Age of Ultron, but at least you would have the slow mo moments. But then you would pull out and see like the electric blur zipping around the train, yeah. And you would get that larger sense. They literally never do that with the Flash, and it's always like these super tight zoom ins on him as he's moving past buildings very slowly, and it just it looks wrong. It looks weird, like. I think you could totally come out of that movie and not quite understand what the Flash is. You would say the Flash slows down time. Exactly. You wouldn't yeah. say he runs fast. Yeah, that you don't have that like outside frame of reference to see, yeah, from someone else's perspective, what does the Flash running look like? And it's like, again, there is a CW TV series that every week illustrates the Flash going fast better than this $300 million movie did. This movie is an act of cinematic malfeasance. Yeah. Because then the other part of the, the costume stuff is that it's really elaborate and really fucking expensive looking. And Batman specifically says, this is the stuff that they make space shuttles out of. And and his whole, like, the Flash's layer or whatever, that with, like, all these, like, fucking supercomputers and giant monitors, is, like, directly contrasted with the scene where he's just about, like, was just done talking with his dad about how he can't get a job. Where the fuck the, is the Flash getting all this stuff? Like, that, you can't sell me this character arc of, like, he's down on his luck, he doesn't quite know what to do with his powers, he doesn't have a job, he doesn't know his direction in life, when he has a super secret computer mega layer with a fucking space shuttle outfit. That's like, that would be like if in Spider-Man Homecoming, Tony <laughs> Stark, or, or, or Spider-Man Homecoming, or in Civil War, whatever, like, wherever you want, like, Tony Stark, 
Tony Stark shows up and he's like, hey, Peter Parker, 16-year-old kid who lives in a fucking apartment with his aunt in Queens. Like, let's hang out. And it's like, oh, do you want to go down to my spider lair? Like, underneath the fucking Brooklyn River in, like, my secret super cave? It's like, oh, I here, let me give you this outfit. Oh, don't worry. I already have one. It's made out of, like, elastic titanium, motherfucker. Like... You can't do that. You can't sell me this like character arc about him being an amateur kid that has no idea what he's doing and taking his first step into a much larger world and then also tell me that he has a space shuttle outfit. Those two things do not fucking coexist. Given the choice between character consistency, visual consistency, all of those like nice things we like in a story, narrative consistency, and just accentuating someone's muscles, whether they exist or not, and just raw visual power. Zack Snyder will always choose the latter, mm -hmm. and he cuts himself off at the knees over and over again. Happened in Watchmen, happened in uh, in uh, Batman v Superman. I don't know what you even categorize Sucker Punch as. Just a weird wet dream, but like, yeah, it's it's he will always cat you like prioritize those really superficial things even if it cuts off the, uh, his character arcs at the knees and that's what happens here yeah and i don't care fanboys online if there was some deleted scene about how his i don't know uncle ran a space sh shuttle or something and that's where he got it from it's not in the movie doesn't count yeah. not in the fucking movie if they put it in the extended cut on the blu-ray still doesn't count yeah still doesn't good count. old larry allen and his space shuttles yeah Anyway, uh, Cyborg's in the movie. That's about all to say about that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, okay, Cyborg, he kind of has an arc. His dad brought him. I don't know really what happened with him. They never explained. There was an accident. Right. Yeah. And he's, yeah, okay, explosion. here, Sean, you know what? You know more about Cyborg than I do. Kind of. I mean, of, in the, in the sure, grand yes. scheme of things. In, yes, in the grand scheme of things. I mean, I know Cyborg almost entirely from the lens of the Teen, Tar Teen Titans cartoon, which did not go into his origins because that show didn't okay. give a shit about that boring stuff. So I don't, I mean, I actually, I did actually read, when it was new, the New 52 Justice League comic book that is the reason why fucking Cyborg is in this movie. If you're wondering why is Cyborg a superhero that nobody knows about, in the Justice League movie, it's because they decided that he was going to be a part of the Justice League in the New 52, and that comic arc was about, like, parademons in, like, Dark Side attacking New York, and so the Justice League had to form because of that. And in that, I think it is, because he's, like, this star football player who's really smart, and then there's some, like, explosion that happens at Star Labs that he's basically killed in, and then his dad uses technology to bring him back to life. I, I just, I understood none of it. I'd heard you make that explanation before on our Batman v Superman podcast. Yeah. When Actually, no, it was when we were doing our predicting the plot of Batman v Superman, where we came up with a much better story in which right. the events at the end of the movie with... Yes, um, creates the accident that kills Victor so that he has to be cyborg. That's right. We also, actually, that same accident would have created the Flash. Yeah. We did it all at once. We wrote a much better movie. Yeah, we, inter we did the work that you needed to do to set up Justice League that yeah. they didn't do. Yeah. Uh, in our 30 minute podcast discussion. Yeah. Anyway, um, I just, I, you get none of it out of this. His dad is like in two scenes and then he's out of the he, movie. Yeah, he just drops out of the movie. I kept on ex feeling like he had to show up somewhere in the third act to sort of like to contrast how far Cyborg had come, but yeah. I mean, he hadn't gone anywhere. So for he a, hadn't evolved as a character yet. For a couple scenes, Cyborg is reluctant and then he stops being reluctant. I could not tell you the scene where that happens. Uh, apparently something about the mother boxes is tied to his body. I they never understood that what that was. They used that technology to rebuild him. I think basically. How? Where? Where was the... Where? What? I don't... Like literally, did they... Did, did Silas Stone have the mother box? What... None of that makes sense to me. Well, you know, no, because the, that was one of the mother boxes giving, given to the race of men, you know, after the fall of the Second Age. So, you know, they, they took that and, like, you know, a corrupted man, but then they used it to make Cyborg. But where do they, where do they get the human mother box? Like, is it from... Cy like, where Minas is it? Morgul. No, no, no! In the movie, oh. I don't even—I don't remember where they pick it up. Like the Justice League, the characters. Cyborg just leaves and gets it. Cyborg leaves okay. at the end, of, so it's after they go because just for like context, because we didn't say this, I finished watching the movie three hours before we started recording this podcast. I so, saw it forty-eight hours ago, and I've forgotten it. Yeah, so it's—I will be your your guide on this wonderful journey down the trip of Justice League, as while it is still vaguely in my short-term memory, it's the whole like second act, this quote unquote second act. Um, fight scene that they have with Steppenwolf where, you know, Aquaman shows up out of nowhere and whatever and they, they the fight just kind of stops and then Cyborg is like, 
the mother box, and he flies up and leaves, and then he comes back, and he has Okay. It. You do not see where he got it from. This is so weird. The, the Justice League is so inactive in this movie. They have no proactivity whatsoever, because... They're, they're just sort of there. They're because just sort of together sometimes. They're just... Because Wonder Woman knows all of this. She is who gives us all the exposition like she's Kate Blanchett in Lord of the Rings. Uh-huh. So she knows about all of this. And Bruce knows that there are parademons coming. And he, he gives that information to Wonder Woman and she gives the exposition. But at no point do they say, maybe we should go guard the mother boxes. So over in Themyscira, Steppenwolf just comes and gets it very easily. And over in Atlantis, Steppenwolf just comes and gets it very easily, even though in the plot of the movie, Wonder Woman, the co-leader of the Justice League, knows where all of these things are. And then the third mother box, I guess they are proactive in that Cyborg realizes all these other people are idiots and just goes and grabs it, but then they just leave it on like a car hood for Steppenwolf to come get. They are the worst fucking superheroes. Yes. Yeah, because I'm, I'm trying to unravel part of the plot because here's what happens is that people are being kidnapped because the, the parademons and Steppenwolf can smell who's been interacting with the mother box. So Star Labs has it because they keep on taking people with Star Labs. Okay. And that's why they take his dad and that's when they go rescue his dad and that's when Cyborg realizes that's what they're after and then Cyborg goes flies off and gets it. I th- and so that's basically what happens. But that reminds me of one of the other things about the movie that is another holdover from of technical and like production issues from Batman v Superman is this movie has fucking awful, terrible, just awful fucking editing. And that's one of the worst pieces of editing in the movie is that they say the line... They're kidnapping people who have been close to the mother box, or aligned to that effect that that's intimating. I forget exactly what right, they right, say, right. but that like that they discover that oh, Steppenwolf, they're kidnapping all these people that are close to the mother box. And then it smash cuts to the random family in the middle of nowhere in Russia who are right. holed up in their house and are being attacked by parademons. Because I thought that's where the mother box was going to be. Because that's what the editing tells you. <laughs> yes, it's like, but it has nothing to do with it at all. That fucking whole thing has nothing to do with anything in the movie. I think it was like their idea of, well, people didn't like it that we weren't focusing on saving civilians, so let's set up some civilians to save. Which is like, that's a bad way of doing that because you're spending a lot of time in this movie that you are like desperately need more time to develop shit, developing something that's like pretty extraneous. But yes, that's like an instance of a couple of times where the editing misleads you. But that one is the most absurd I've ever seen. Where like everything you know about the language of film tells you instinctively that when you say that line about, oh, they're kidnapping people that are involved with the mother box. And then you smash cut to this new location that that's what is happening at that new location. And the parademons are there too. Yes, and the parademons are attacking that building. Because here's the, so I saw this movie two days ago. I have two degrees in film. Yeah, right? And I don't remember where the second mother box was. Or the human one was. Yeah. I just... I literally... Like, Sean, you're telling me this now? I still don't remember the scene where Cyborg goes and gets it. It is not in my... It's I did not, not encode no, it. This is, the, this is the mistake you're making. It's not a scene where Cyborg goes <laughs> right. and gets it. There's a scene where they're standing around and talking after... The, the after the big fight scene, Cyborg just leaves in the middle of them talking and comes back by the time they're done talking and has the mother box. You don't see Cyborg go and get the mother box. He just goes and gets the mother box off screen in the middle of a totally different scene. Again, like, this is a level of cinematic incompetence. I don't know how it happens. I don't know how this movie goes out the door. I thought that about Batman v Superman. I thought that about Suicide Squad. I think that about Justice League. And you know what? I think Batman v Superman might be the best of those three movies. Uh Because at least... I don't... We can get into that. But like... I just... The number of people who have to look at this movie and say... Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. No, that makes no sense. But yeah. Fuck fuck it. They're going to be eating popcorn. They don't care. Put it out. It's incredible how incompetent so many people have to be for this to happen. Yeah. All right, other character arcs. We talked about Superman. That was all weird. Yeah, Superman doesn't have a character arc. No, he's, he's a bad not. version of Superman. He's not a character in this movie. He has yeah. no character traits. He has no discernible personality. He has nothing. He's introduced, you know, over halfway through the movie. Yeah, and, and barely has any. Doesn't scenes. matter. Poor Amy Adams. I just, I kept every time it would cut to Amy Adams. I'm like, she has, and I looked this up. Amy Adams has five Academy Award nominations. Oh, man. She is, like, one of the most respected actors of her generation. Everyone loves Amy Adams. And, 
if you want like exhibit A of of how women are treated in Hollywood in terms of the roles they get, look at Amy Adams in Justice League. You cannot rise much higher in this industry as a woman than Amy Adams has, and she is just sad that Superman is dead, I think. Yeah. I don't really know more than that. And apparently, when that happens to uh, the female character, she's also can no longer write or do her job. Which right? feels yes, like, yeah. you know, that's a very Zack Snyder thing to write. But anyway. Yeah. I mean, it's at least Marvel let Natalie Portman go because they realized they, they had nothing to do with her in the Thor movies. Right. So they're like, you know, yeah, like, we don't need you. Like, like the characters have gone in a different direction. You can go be in your own movies, Natalie Portman, because there's, we can't just, like, write roles for you. The characters have gone in a different direction. Yeah. They should have just wrote, written, written Lois Lane out of this. There's no reason for her to be in this movie other yeah. than she's a plot device that helps Superman stop having his rage boner yeah. in the middle of the film. It's so dumb, and Amy Adams looks miserable. Like Jennifer Lawrence in X-Men Apocalypse kinds of miserable. Yeah. But more so. Anyway, poor Amy Adams. Um, so all of that happens. Let's see. Uh, I don't know if I have anything substantive to say about Batman in this movie. He That's is, a good way to put it. He is in no way recognizably Batman. He does nothing really Batman-esque. He mostly drives around and shoots guns. Uh, one, he, I think he uses a grapple hook one time. The bat, he the does, costume yeah. still looks stupid. Ben Affleck doesn't want to be there and looks like someone had to drag him onto the set every single day. That's just a complete disaster of a character. And I bet Matt Reeves, who is directing the standalone Batman movie, wakes up every day and prays to God that Ben Affleck drops out of this franchise before he has to start making that Batman movie. Yeah. It's just, yeah, he has no charisma as Batman. He has no charm as Bruce Wayne at all. And so that's like... And he, had, he spends most of the movie as Bruce Wayne. And it's just And like, he had like little sparks of it in Batman v Superman. Yeah. Where there would be scenes like, like okay, I could buy that guy as a rich playboy billionaire. Nothing in this one. Yeah. And yeah, he's really dull as Batman. The movie also has that like the first scene with Batman, which is really weird where... You know, they're kind of trying to do their more kind of comic booky Batman thing of, you know, he's fighting the robber that's on the roof of Gotham. And before the Parademon shows up and Batman starts fighting the Parademon. What's really fucking weird about that scene is who is this criminal dude that's just there that Batman starts fighting him to, like, make him afraid to the Parademon shows up. So that Batman starts fighting the Parademon who then, the, this is one of the weirdest bits of plotting in the movie. Batman shoves the Parademon against the wall and the Parademon dissolves and leaves an imprint of the three mother boxes on the wall, which is how Batman kind of knows that the three mother boxes are a thing. I have no fucking clue what any of that is referring to. But the most inexplicable thing to me is after the criminal has just been watching that, the criminal's just standing around chatting with Batman. Batman doesn't give a shit. Batman just says Alfred's name on the intercom right in front of this fucking, like, Gotham <laughs> criminal. Another instance where it just feels like, is anybody watching this movie? Because it just feels like such a weird detail to miss of, like, that feels so off character for Batman to just do that. And, and again, like, it's just... And then Batman, I don't even think this shows Batman leaving. It just cuts away and you have no idea what this criminal character, who is the first character you meet in the whole movie, because that's how the movie opens, he's just... It just disappears. Like, that scene just disappears. And it's such a... It's just It immediately lets you know what movie you're watching is that it's just completely unhinged from everything else in the film. Yeah. Um, you know, we already covered with, like, the trailers showed this, frankly, that, like, they didn't do the thing where they're trying to sell that the world is sad about Superman. None of that tracks with anything else in, in yeah. the, the other films. That I mean, again, the entire plot of Batman v Superman is that the world hates Superman and Batman wants to kill him with a kryptonite spear. Like, that's yeah. the plot of that movie. You cannot retcon that away. They try to do that. I don't buy it. Um, okay, Wonder yeah. Woman. I, I want to just say, like, really quickly, the, the, before we move on to Wonder Woman, about uh, Batman, because I have um, the IMDb page pulled up here. And for the storyline little, like, snippet they have, it begins with... Fueled by his restored faith in humanity and inspired by self Superman's selfless act, Bruce Wayne enlists the help of blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And I just love that fueled by his restored faith in humanity inspired by Superman's selfless act is such a, like, I guess that's technically his character motivation and stuff in the movie. It just doesn't ever no. come across particularly no. well. It looks like he really wants to retire. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um... 
I've said it before, the only way you can make a standalone Batman movie out of this work is if it's Batman Beyond, and then Ben Affleck just has to play crotchety old Bruce Wayne, and I think he could do that yeah. pretty decently, and then you can focus on a new Batman. That'd yeah. be fun. That'd be actually be kind of cool. They're not going to do that. No. Um, anyway, uh, let's see. So Wonder Woman, Gal Gadot, or Gal Gadot, I, I never quite know how to say it. Gal. She's awesome. She's always good. Yeah. She's very good in this as well. She, you know, she gets more to do here than she did in like Batman v Superman, for instance. Yeah, they're the most, the biggest flashes of personality in the whole movie come from her. I think she is a movie star. She's great. I think, and I am surprised I haven't seen more writing on this yet. They sell her down the river so hard in the plot of this movie yeah. because the entire like. You know, reshot character motivation stuff for Wonder Woman because she probably had no lines in the Zack Snyder version of this movie. Let's be real. She's the woman on the team. She doesn't get to talk. But in this version of the movie, her whole arc is about how apparently she's just been hiding in the shadows for the hundred years since Chris Pine died in the Wonder Woman film. Uh And Batman is like mansplaining to her, like literally the definition of mansplaining why she should be a hero and be more out there and stuff. And I guess she kind of does... No, she doesn't. She doesn't. She just fights with the team at certain points. And I, I don't know. Like, he... like They keep throwing around the Chris Pine character's name. Yeah, Batman Steve and Trevor. Wonder Woman. Steve Trevor, Batman and Wonder Woman almost fight about it at one point, but not really. And it, it just feels like the people made, who made this movie, like, heard from someone else who saw the Wonder Woman movie about the plot of the Wonder Woman movie, but didn't actually bother to watch it because, you know, that's the woman's movie and who gives a yeah. shit. And, like... That's how they made this movie. It's a complete misreading of the end of Wonder Woman, which whatever issues you have of it, the Steve Trevor sacrifice is a very good thematic capstone to that film. And Wonder Woman, the whole point of the ending of that movie is that she has this new nuanced faith in humanity that pushes her forward to like, I am going to defend this planet. This is my world. I live here now. Yeah. Apparently not, according to Justice League. And it's just, and it's all very much framed in this male centric, patriarchal way that, that Zack Snyder and the DC movies like to do, where Batman, because he is the older, gruff man who likes to kill people, he knows best. Wonder Woman is the dumb little girl. She doesn't Even get it. Even though she's like, over a hundred years old. Yes, she's and, way older than Batman, and has and she's has far wiser, and has manifestly accomplished more in the yeah. films we have seen. Yeah, uh, he has to mansplain all this shit to her, and she doesn't even really get to resolve that arc at the end. Yeah, no, it's something of it's another area where I think the movie had a lot of issues before it even started because Batman v Superman set up this idea. That nobody knows who Wonder Woman is. Like, even Batman didn't know who Wonder Woman was, right? Like, that's part of the plot of Batman v Superman and how they introduce this character. And then you do this Wonder Woman movie that's set in World War One that ends, as you have identified, with Diana having this, this renewed faith in humanity and this, like, clear dedication to fighting for, like, truth and justice and everything that's good. You know, like, that's... Her arc, because her that's her whole arc in the movie, is she starts from a place where she wants to be able to do that, but can't. In the second act, she she now is confronted with these ideas that maybe that's not even the right thing to do because of, like, war is complicated and, you know, all that shit. And then at the end, she's like, no, actually, this is what I need to do, and this is how I can do it. And that's, that's her character arc in that movie. And yet somehow, apparently between that movie and Batman v Superman in Justice League that her character are completely reversed to be like back where she was at the beginning of Wonder Woman and completely like sheltered off and, and unable o- to do anything about the world. And not only that, but the consistent implication from Batman, who is like the older patriarchal voice of the film, is that you're still sad about Steve Trevor. Yes, that and that's entirely motivated by the death of Steve Trevor. By the death of her boyfriend. Yeah. Which again, like, it is incredibly sexist. I don't want to sugarcoat that. It is the most sexist thing Joss Whedon has written on film. And it's how, just it's just contrary to everything you understand about that character if you saw yeah. the one good DC movie they made, made the yeah. one that people liked that had the character they liked in it. And, and again, like, how do you let this out the door that way? That yeah. you know your biggest hit, the movie people liked most. Wonder Woman has grossed more than either of their other ones, more than Man of Steel. That's the hit. That's the one people like. And then this movie fucks her and you're like, okay, put it out. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah. It's just it's in a, it's uh, 
you know, I Gal Gadot. I, I hope you know she she had the whole thing where um, recently where she demanded they kick Brett Ratner off the sequel. Um, he you know he, as a producer um, for her to sign on for it, and I just hope she and Patty Jenkins, the director of Wonder Woman and you know Wonder Woman two, demand continue to demand better from the, for this character, and that yeah. if she's in a team up movie again in the future, I hope they have more say in this because I imagine they would be as frustrated with a lot of this as we are. Yeah. Especially like so. fucking, you know, Patty Jenkins who did all this hard work making this great standalone Wonder Woman movie and then she's sitting down to watch Justice League and it's like, that's not the movie I made. Yeah, that's not the character. You didn't did. watch my movie. Yeah. I, it's got to be frustrating. It's got to be. I don't know. It's, it's incredibly frustrating as a viewer. Yeah. Like the, that being like the one part of the movie I was kind of looking forward to was like, well, I really liked her as Wonder Woman. Yeah. I, let's see what they do with Wonder Woman. And it's like, oh, they just completely fucked that one up. And other than she and the Superman stop Steppenwolf at the last, at the end of the really limp final action scene, she does not really active in the action either. Like, yeah. it just, they seem very disinterested in Wonder Woman for the I whole mean, movie. Is part of the issue is like, she's so much more powerful than like anybody else. Yeah, that, like it, it, I think they have a hard time trying to figure out how to balance the action scenes. But then they it's, have to conveniently ignore yeah. that for the whole Superman thing of like we're yeah. not powerful enough. And it's like Wonder Woman is just as powerful. Like yeah. that's just a thing we know about this. It's it's ridiculous. Yeah. Also, realistically, the Flash is just as powerful as all the other ones too. Oh, I the Flash is the most powerful hero, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can't you can't just have the Flash go full Flash. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, the CGI in this movie. Yes. It's so bad. This is the cheapest looking $300 million movie I've ever seen. Previously, I would have given that award to Pirates of the Caribbean 4, which cost like $400 million, so it's out of control. The more money you spend on a movie, the cheaper it looks, I think, is actually the way this works. Um, because those, like, if you look at the most expensive movies ever made, like this, Pirates 4, some other, like, like Disney's The Lone Ranger, things like that, they're all horrible, cheap looking pieces of shit. And this is one of those. Um, the movie looks like it has like five locations overall actually yeah. because clearly so much of it was reshot on sound stages like so so much of it is in like the bat cave or in the, the jet or just in alleyways and shit and then everything else is on green screens of locations from other movies and the CGI is uniformly horrible Steppenwolf uh, it looks like someone watched the Hobbit movies and saw Azog and said I bet we can make an even more fake looking villain and an even more boring villain and that's what they did here and then the final action sequence it's not just bad CGI barf it ha it's like five minutes long it has three beats the only thing that happens you could even call kind of cool is the thing with Aquaman in the trailers where he like throws the thing the trident he goes gushes the guy and then like goes through the building that's the only like real money shot in all of that and it was already spoiled and then the end is just Superman helps Cyborg pull the mother boxes apart and that was it and it was really astonishingly easy and then they kill Steppenwolf very easily and then it's over and there's yeah. nothing to it bad yeah. movie no like and just let's just talk about Steppenwolf a little bit because oh, he yeah. is he's like He's the antagonist of the movie, and it's basically like, you know, Avengers had Loki, and then they had the Chitari, and that was like how they, they managed to have their fun, cool, compelling villain, and then their big, large, giant force to be able to, like, give a giant enemy for the, the team to fight. And this, they kind of just don't have any compelling antagonist at all, because it's just Steppenwolf, who is, as you said... Terrible CGI. You never also terrible and utterly unnecessary CGI because his design is just a dude and a, a tall guy in a funny hat. Like you could put him in some makeup and a costume, guys. Like that would be like need if maybe have him be all digital. That would be like if in Thor Ragnarok they decided Kate Blanchett's character would be all digital. Exactly. Yes, it's yeah. just utterly unnecessary. Uh, fun fact about the making of this movie: they had not even cast Steppenwolf when the Zack Snyder round of shooting was finished. So that's how much they cared about this villain. They yeah. completely did it in post. Yeah, it's just... But then also, like, the another big issue with Steppenwolf, and then it's, I think it's a larger structural issue with the movie, is they steal the opening, as we said, they steal the opening from The Fellowship of the Ring, but it's not the beginning of the movie. It should have been the beginning of the movie. Yeah. Because for most of the movie, you have no idea who Steppenwolf is, what his motivations are, where he comes from, what the fuck he's doing. You have to wait until the midpoint of the movie to have any idea about any of that shit. Because it's also really complicated. Because he's not just a normal villain. He's not just like 
Loki, who is a god of mischief and wants to, like, trick shit, you know? He's not just, a, like, a random bad guy. He's got all this weird mythology and his plot is really convoluted because he needs to have these three mystical artifacts of the mother boxes and bring them together to form the unity to, re like, terraform Earth to be, like, Apocalypse, but they can't say, they they're just don't say Apocalypse for whatever reason, but the planet that he's from, because it's all dark side, like, new god shit. And it's just... There's a reason why the beginning of Fellowship of the Rings, that scene is the beginning of that movie. Because you need to set the stakes of what are we fighting against because it's big and complicated and it's Sauron. And if you're going to rip off that scene, beat for beat, almost like like lines of dialogue almost just replace Atlantean with dwarf and fucking uh, uh, Amazons with elves. Like they literally just say, you know, like this like last alliance of the Atlanteans and the Amazonians and the race of men. It's like... That's just the fucking Lord of the Rings. And and then they get these three artifacts, one of which goes to, you know, one mother box for the elf kings under the sky and all that shit. They <laughs> basically just do that. Like, if you're going to set all those stakes about the history of this conflict, you need to do it at the beginning of the movie and lend some gravitas so that by the time that Steppenwolf shows up, you're like, oh shit, this guy's a, this is a bad motherfucker because this is the guy that almost laid waste to the entire planet like 5,000 years ago. But when Steppenwolf shows up, you're just like, I don't know who that is. Who the fuck is that dude? I have no idea. Yeah. It's incomprehensible. We don't know what Steppenwolf's motivations are other than just the very mechanical what he wants to do with the mother boxes. Yeah. Which even that, like, I think 90% of viewers aren't going to get because it's a throwaway line in the middle of the Lord of the Rings sequence. Um, so he's not a character. He has no motivations. He has no arc. He has no personality. He has absolutely nothing. Um, they got a good actor named Sirian Hines to voice him, and he gets to do nothing with it. Uh, he has no discernible powers other than being big and having an axe. It is just a completely creatively bankrupt villain. And it's, um, again, I just can't believe anyone allowed this to go yeah. forth. Also, as someone who's a big fan of the comic books and the cartoons and, like, the DC Universe, I don't give a fuck about Steppenwolf. I barely know who Steppenwolf is. I'm excited about seeing Darkseid. Darkseid's an amazing, awesome DC villain. I want to see Darkseid. Like, like, I don't think they'd do a good version of that, but there would be a, a stupid part of my brain that I hate that would flash up and be like, hey, that's Darkseid. He's cool. He was cool in the cartoons, wasn't he? Yeah. Like, like, this is like Steppenwolf. I think he was in an episode of Justice League Unlimited. Maybe. Steppenwolf's the kind of comic book villain who barely has a Wikipedia page. Exactly. Like, yeah. he's so obscure. Like, it's just, again, the logic of we're going to make our big Justice League movie. We're going to spend $300 million on it. Who's our villain? Steppenwolf. It's a name that every time we've said it in this conversation, Sean, I have to resist laughing because every time they said it in the movie, I laughed. And I was annoying people in the theater, and I know that, but you cannot have, you know, Ben Affleck go, it's Steppenwolf, and not have me laugh at it. It's a dumb fucking name for a villain, and it's a dumb villain, and you just can't have me take it seriously if that's the character. Yeah. I'm also, I'm just looking at Steppenwolf's uh, the page on Wikipedia and his fictional character biography is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven paragraphs long. <laughs> so yeah, it's not, he's not, honestly like about half of his fucking thing is the, the section in the DC movie part with Justice League and that's yeah. most of his fucking Wikipedia page. So, I yeah. mean, okay, clearly with everything they were setting up in Batman v Superman and knowing that Justice League was originally intended to be a two-part film, is how they right, announced yes, it. Yeah. So clearly, I think what they were... If, if you could get back to like the Zack Snyder like assembly cut of this film, I'm guessing the whole point was like Steppenwolf was this placeholder villain uh, uh, like and like Darkseid was going to come later and that was going to be the whole idea and yeah. like probably the end of Justice League 1 would have been like the, um, the, the, the cliffhanger for that, like Darkseid is coming next, you would have done that. I think there probably would have been a lot more about all the weird... Um, stuff in the dream sequences in Batman v Superman where like there's the weird imagined future and all that yeah um Superman uh someone pointed to this out to me on Twitter and I think they're right Superman almost certainly in the Zack Snyder version of this was resurrected as like evil dark Superman oh, and would yeah. have been like one of the bad guys and something and like that would have led to some of the future arc stuff in that they clearly stripped as much of that out of the movie as they possibly could so it's just its own little thing and then they can get back to making you know something else but they have pulled the ripcord on all of that stuff from batman v superman 
that will never happen. We'll never learn why the Flash came back from the future. I was just talking. thinking that too, that they didn't, that wasn't in this movie. So I guess, no. and I assume, presumably that was going to be the idea. Yeah, Unless no. Unless they're and, just like, let's put some random bullshit in so that way, at some point way in the future, we can use it if we want to, which would be a weird way to make a movie. Yeah, no. I Unless like that, they've retconned all of that to be in the, the Flashpoint movie they're planning on making, which I don't think is going to get made after this. Yeah. But yeah. Um, what else to say about the movie itself? Um, Jeremy Irons is in it as Alfred. Forgot. He's in a couple of scenes. Um, this is the big one that, like, I was, now that I have the IMDb page in front of me, um, J.K. Simmons was in it as Gordon. Right, for one in, scene. Yeah, in, in one and a half scenes, I would say. One and a half, yeah. let's be fair. To I mean, that's Simmons. the thing. Clearly, there were going to be more scenes with him. There were going to be some more scenes in Atlantis, because they cast Amber Heard. Like, they cast name actors for these things. Yeah. I don't know. That He seemed like a good Gordon. I love J.K. Simmons. Yeah. But whatever. It's that was also another moment in the movie though when the bat signal goes off and they all go up and it's like that's your first big hero shot of Batman, Wonder Woman, Cyborg, and Flash are all together in costume. It's the first time you've seen the Flash in costume, and they just show up on a rainy rooftop to talk to Commissioner Gordon. It's like this feels like a bad spot in your movie to try to do your first shot of like the team basically being together in costumes. Like obviously Aquaman isn't there, but when Aquaman's is there, he's also not there, and Superman's not there, but he's not there for most of the movie. So it's like that's kind of like your first actual shot of the team together, and it's a very nothing exposition scene. Yeah. Uh, what else? Uh, the Danny Elfman score is not good, and it's also my brother was uh, really angry about this. It just kind of sells out the Batman and Superman themes from other movies because yeah. it it uses the Danny Elfman Batman theme just as kind of this. It just emptily in some scenes for no real rhyme or reason other than it's Danny Elfman, and then. There is the only, like, musical theme that has true... Well, I guess there's the Wonder Woman one also. But, like, major... You have that. You also have... There's the Superman theme that's carried through from Man of Steel that Hans Zimmer wrote. Yeah. And they use it momentarily. And then he just uses pieces of the John Williams theme. Like, it's all so confused. It's no real musical cohesion. And then the rest of it is Danny Elfman on full-on autopilot. Yeah. Just boring as a sin. Um, yeah, poorly edited. Bad CGI. Um... It's two hours. It feels like three. Uh, you did not stick around for the last post credit scene. No, I know what it is. But yeah, it's Jesse it. Eisenberg's Lex Luthor because that's who we were all clamoring to see again. Yeah. Uh, on a yacht and Deathstroke comes in. And I was just thinking to myself, man, Deathstroke looks just like Deadpool. And then I realized, oh, Deadpool is a parody of Deathstroke. I read <laughs> online. Yes. And yeah. also, every person in the audience will go, that looks like Deadpool, because Deadpool is the popular movie character. Yeah. I know Deathstroke was in the comics first. It does not matter to mainstream movie audiences. Anyway, I'm not excited about that. He made a really bad League of Our Own pun. Yeah. Um, Which is also like, you know, you can make your League of Your Own pun, but they, we all know they formed the Legion of Doom, so they don't even make a League. They make a Legion. So it's like, yeah. get it right, fucking bullshit, fake Lex Luthor. Anyway... Uh, Jesse Eisenberg bald still looks wrong um, it's just all bad it's all yeah. bad there's like nothing interesting or worth recommending about this it is a creatively bankrupt movie yeah again like even if you like the action it's like the same thing as you said in Batman v Superman the action's not good so if like if you're just in here to be like I just want to watch a movie where Batman and Superman and everyone fights things like no, there's none this of it. This is like, go watch one of the cartoons where they have well choreographed and interesting action sequences and develop characters through it this is like bad action. There's, it's also it's just like Batman v Superman in that there's re barely any action in the movie it's, anyway. Yeah, Batman v Superman has just the two scenes: the the fight in the title, and then the big blowout at the end with b -b 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 what's his name? Uh, Doomsday. Doomsday. Yeah, yeah, who doesn't give a shit? Doesn't matter. Yeah, no. And in Justice League, there's still there's two. There's the last thing at the end of the movie, and there's the thing in the middle in the sewers. Neither of which really qualify as action scenes because they're just incoherent and dumb and the one in the middle of the movie at the sewers just feels like it's there because they need to have an action scene before the end of the movie yeah. like it's it's really unnecessary to the plot it kind of they don't especially because they don't do much with the characters it also like it should serve a strong character development function but since they haven't set up the characters properly it doesn't even do that well let's talk about dc okay yes and where they are so okay. sean here let me tell you a little greek tragedy for us Okay. Okay. I'm familiar is, with these. I have a degree that says one, I'm familiar with these. One, one day, a Warner Brothers executive was sitting in his golden tower, reading Deadline.com, 
the weekend of May 2012. And he saw that the Avengers had made $200 million opening weekend. Ooh. And he said unto himself, why can we not have these kinds of monies? We have many heroes. In we our... have the Superman. We, we have the Batman. We even have Wonder the Woman. So why can we not do this? And he said to his underlings, we should do this by the year 2017. And they said to him, that's only five years in the future. That seems like a little quick. Are we going to make movies for all the heroes? And he said, no, we're going to make one Batman v Superman movie. But we're going to throw Dawn of Justice in there so we can get more things in the uh, search engine optimization. And we're going to introduce it all there. And then our very next movie will be Justice League. And someone pointed out, but what about the other months? And he said, we will make a Wonder Woman movie because she will be in Batman v Superman. And we will make a Suicide Squad movie because I just saw that on Wikipedia and it sounds edgy and the kids will like it. And lo, they made their Batman v Superman movie and everybody hated it, but it made some money. And lo, they made their Suicide Squad movie, and I wanted to kill myself after I watched it, but it made some money, and it some weird goth teens liked it. And then they made their Wonder Woman movie, and because they deigned to hire a woman with talent, it was good, and people liked it, and it made more money than the other ones. And someone at the Warner Brothers executive's office said, this seems like something we should go after more, and he said, wait, wait. We still have Justice League. And someone pointed out, but the movie is a disaster and our director just quit. What do we do to fix it? And he said, put as much money as you want into it. It will be fine. We're going to get that Avengers money. That's why we here's, started this. Here's our secret weapon. We're just going to get the guy who made the Avengers. And lo, they got Joss Whedon and spent upwards of $300 million finishing the movie. And then it came out and lo... It had the lowest opening weekend of any DC Extended Universe film at Sunday estimates of $96 million, less than half of what the Avengers movie the Warner Brothers executive had pined for. Yes. And thus, his dreams were shattered. Yes. And as you say, even less than Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, which was a less expensive movie to make by about $50 million. Even less than Wonder Woman, which was not projected to have that level of an opening weekend. Yeah. Wonder Woman broke $100 million. Yep. It is, I mean, there's no way to read this other than a failure. It, it'll it make some money. No, obviously, $96 million. I'd love to have $96 million. Oh, that'd be great. But I mean, spent... I'd also love avoiding paying $300 million. Yes, because they spent $300 million on this movie. That does not include marketing, which is probably at least another 100 if you go by industry standards. Uh, they will be lucky to break $200 million at the U.S. box office, which is a stunning thing for a movie called Justice League, that it breaking $200 million is an open question. It probably will not get there if it has a multiplier similar to Batman v Superman, which did less than two times its opening weekend. It won't hit that. And worldwide, it's lagging as well. So the movie's not going to be a bomb in that no one went to see it, but it in no way justified the cost that went into it. And it in no way justifies future Justice League sequels. And all of their best laid plans, which I really would say are the most incompetently laid plans I've ever seen for a movie franchise, yeah. have fallen to pieces. Uh, people didn't like this one either. Marginally better reviews than Batman v Superman, but not by much. Fans didn't really come out for it in you know the masses yeah. here. Um, I think even like the most diehard DC fanboys are like tired by this point yeah like, I, haven't I haven't even seen i used to have some entertainment back when batman v superman was a thing of like a i indulging a like dark part of myself that i don't like about myself but it's there of just like diving into the darkest corners of the internet and seeing their reactions to shit and seeing like the insane defensiveness and even that's like it's not here eh, yeah they don't get like i don't think like I would be. It would be interesting to talk to some like professional film reviewers and find out like how many death threats are you getting over Justice League? Not as many. Interesting. Yeah, it's turns out just trying to rush for the money as fast as humanly possible didn't work. Yeah, and and I feel like you can probably load up an episode of this podcast from like five years ago when we like were first hearing about the the like the germs of the DC plan and 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 just being like. Well, this sounds like a bad way to do this. Like, you're going from Man of Steel to Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. That sure doesn't sound like a way to make a good fucking team-up movie eventually. It just... This is nuts. I, it really... It's all kind of already fallen apart. And I don't know what they do to pull it out after this. Because I think as a larger extended universe... 
I'm done. It's there's nothing here. God, there's I was nothing so to do. tired at the end of this movie. Just like it's I just... can't do this because I really love these characters. Like that's the other side of it is I have a whole like childhood of watching these characters. Yeah, the cartoons that are some of my favorite cartoons of, from my childhood. And it's like it's just painful at some point to see it done this poorly. And you know the thing people would keep pointing out is like, well, yeah, everyone hated Batman v Superman, but it it made all that money, and su- people hated Suicide, but it made all that money, and blah, 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 blah. but the buck stops eventually. Yeah, which is that, yeah, you make two incredibly shitty movies and rip people off. Yes, it will underperform expectations. And again, Justice League has not bombed, but relative to its cost, it absolutely underperformed. And you don't get bigger after that you know like avengers 2 didn't do better than avengers 1 like you don't push high like this is supposed to be the moment when you tie it all together and launch new things they've completely pulled justice league 2 off the calendar they don't really know i think what they're doing with the batman movie because their star doesn't know if he wants to be in it they're planning a weird like todd phillips directed joker origin story movie the only other movie they have on the calendar is uh wonder woman 2 and suicide squad 2 i think they keep going back and forth on the flash it is an utter train wreck of a franchise and the one bright spot is they made one good wonder woman movie and i hope they can continue to support that yeah but you need to burn down everything else and start over and we can just pretend like right the the gal gadot wonder woman in those other movies different wonder woman Start a new continuity. This didn't work. You can't salvage it. It's done. Yeah. And I just feel like you have to look at those numbers and the reception to this. And it's like, if you couldn't pull it together for Justice League, when are you going to pull it together? It's, you know, someone tweeted this the other day before the movie had come out. And I think it's kind of the best response possible to summarize all of this, which is someone said, I'm seeing Justice League in four hours and I'm not in any way excited. I would not have predicted that as a kid. Right. You know, yeah. a movie called Justice League is finally in theaters and we had no enthusiasm for it. The movie had nothing to offer and it didn't even do that big of business for the studio. Yeah, it's it just, did like half a Hunger Games. It's, it's it's really it's really insane that this is where we're at that like that comic book movies are the biggest thing in Hollywood. They have been for a long time now. Again, Iron Man 1 is 10 years old next year. Yeah. That's fucking crazy. And, you know, outside of the Christopher Nolan Batman movies that they they made that were very good and successful, they've just... DC's just fucked. They're fucked. They had that and they made a good Wonder Woman movie. But a good Wonder Woman movie that is also in some ways crippled because it's directly attached to all this other shit. So if they keep on wanting to push that more forward in the timeline, they're going to have to deal with that at some point. Or just fucking ignore it. Just pull yeah. an X-Men, Fox X-Men, and just be like, fuck it, these are the Wolverine movies now, it doesn't matter. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's if you had asked me, t- let's say 10 years ago, when the Marvel experiment was starting with Iron Man, yeah. and that was also the year where The Dark Knight came out. It was 2008. Yes. End of that summer, you asked me, all right, 10 years or 9 years from now, there's going to be a Justice League movie. And there's going to be a third Thor sequel. <laughs> which which one is going to do better? Who on earth would have predicted the Thor sequel does better? I mean, who would have ever predicted there'd be a third <laughs> fucking Thor movie? And it's like one of the best superhero movies. Yeah. I mean, like thoroughly, in ev- by every possible metric, the third Thor movie did better than the big Justice League movie. That Like everybody at Warner Brothers should be ashamed that they let that happen. Yeah. Is like, here's a movie starring Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman. The three most iconic and recognizable superheroes ever. Like, globally. And here's the one starring Thor. The guy that people don't even know as a Marvel (laughs) superhero. If they know about Thor, they know him because they fucking heard, like, read some fucking story about Norse mythology in high school. You know? Like, and Thor 3. Thor 3... (laughs) Is better than the fucking movie starring the three most iconic and well-known superheroes in the history of the world. It's just... And and I think this is a really good test case. Thor Ragnarok coming out right before Justice League. In that, like, you know, that's... 
laying the groundwork and doing the legwork of like, no one knows who Thor is, so let's make a good movie and show them who Thor is. And let's cast someone cool and let's put our heart and soul into trying to make this work. And no, not, for Thor, not every step along the way was perfect. A lot of people don't like Thor 1 and 2. They're not the highest grossing Marvel movies. They had issues like how best to use Chris Hemsworth. Yeah. But they put in the work long enough and it organically became Thor Ragnarok and everyone loves it and everyone went to see it. And meanwhile... You know, you try to fucking make Justice League out of a can from Concentrate, and it doesn't work. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. I, it's it's kind of incredible where we're at with this. Yeah. I want to go back to the world when we had, like, the first sort of teaser trailer for Man of Steel, and we were both pretty optimistic, but, like, it looks like they're going to do something interesting with this. This seems like a cool direction for Superman. We haven't had a good Superman movie in a long time. Let's do Superman. And here we are now. <laughs> just, it's just, it's it's not just DC. It's the fucking world, Jonathan. It's the world. What has happened to the world? Maybe I can summarize everything going on in the world right now with one pithy response. Okay. The last truly good movie with Superman in it, or like decent, was probably Superman Returns from 2006. Like it's yeah. the best of all of those, right? Oh, definitely, Yes. The guy who directed that, Brian Singer, we now know uh, is predatory towards young men. <laughs> so that's the world we live in, Sean. The last guy to successfully direct Superman uh, probably won't direct in Hollywood again if anyone has morals. Yeah. That's where we are. Anyway, Justice League, don't see it. Uh, oh, no. Do, uh, yeah, no. do you see Thor? It's fun. Oh, Thor's awesome. Um, yeah. Pokemon, so far, I enjoyed that. I'm just trying to summarize the podcast. I don't know. We'll we'll probably be back next week. We'll talk about other things. Yeah. Fuck this movie. Just fuck all of this. I'm I'm gonna go watch the Justice League cartoon.